You are listening to Dove Valley Deep Divers with Eric Trickle and Lance Sanderson. Ball comes out of the hands of Newton. It's on the ground, picked up by T.J. Ward at the four-yard line. Vaughn Miller did it again. On Overtime Media. And it looks like we are live. Got green check marks across all platforms, so it looks like we're ready to go. Mile high, hello everybody in Broncos country, and welcome into another episode of the Dove Valley Deep Divers Live podcast. I'm your host, Lance Sanderson, and joining me as always is my good friend and colleague. He is your Denver Broncos insider and Mile High Huddle senior NFL draft analyst, the one and only Eric Trickle. Now, Eric, today is Friday, July 3rd. Tomorrow is Friday, July 4th, uh, Independence Day. It's we, we, you know, if we had our Saturday show, we could have a, uh, you know, the July 4th special for everybody, Chad. But uh, anyways, this is going to be the, the the Independence Day special for the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. Man, how are you doing first off? And secondly, do you have any big plans for the weekend? I'm doing really good. As for plans, not really. Just probably playing. Yeah, I know this is going to be a little bit weird, but probably just playing Pokemon Go with the family a little bit, going out and doing some stuff, doing that. We don't really have big plans. We don't really... I don't want to say we don't celebrate 4th of July, but we don't ever really do anything like anything big. We just kind of sit back, relax a little bit and just have a good time. Plus, I'm actually going to be on the show tomorrow with Nick because Luke has some plans with family and stuff like that. So I'm going to be doing this on it. And yeah, I'm just excited. I mean, I hope everyone else has a good 4th of July doing whatever it is you're doing. I believe you're having a barbecue, right? Yeah, man. We get together. Yeah, we actually have a, a pretty much a family reunion for all of Samantha's family. Uh, all of her family from up in Washington is down. Um, aunts and uncles, grandma and grandpa, everybody. Um, all the kids are finally back. So Jace is back from his family vacation. I haven't actually got a chance to see him yet. Uh, he got back so late last night. I was actually in bed by the time they got here. But uh, I, I'm very excited to see my buddy and uh, also to go meet some more of her side of the family and to mm-hmm. kind of introduce myself and and to show him that I'm at least a halfway decent kind of guy, or at least I think so. But but uh, no, I've got. To, I bought a, a, a big box of ribs for for tomorrow. Going to smoke some ribs up, do jalapeno poppers, and just have a pile of food. Bought way too many uh, fireworks and, and everything. So it's looking up to be a pretty decent time, at least in the Sanderson household. And we'll love the Sanderson yeah. and Guler household is is well, her her family. So, but yeah, it's it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, I just hope that no aliens show up. <laughs> in your independence day and cobra commander the thing is is that it's never been something that we've really done within my family it's i mean we're happy for our independence and we're happy for our freedom and everything and but the issue is here is like there's nothing really big that happens on this year and because of what's going on in the world there's no fourth of july parade so there's nothing for us to go to normally i take my daughter to see that there's just nothing really for us to do my wife has to work i have the podcast so by the time we're able to do stuff together it's already going to be after about seven o'clock my time so we just we just typically don't do stuff a little bit. We just kind of just, as I said, relax, have a good day. I mean, we have good food. I mean, we typically we typically do like burgers or hot dogs or stuff like that. And but eh, it's just not it's just not. I don't want to say it's not a big thing for us, but we just never make a big thing out of it. I guess would be yeah. the best way to put it. Yeah, different strokes for different different folks, man. I mean, everybody gets to enjoy their freedoms given given down by God and yep. get, per the constitutional rights and everything of this country. So it's it's a it's an amazing thing. You don't have to go out and blow up a whole bunch of stuff, shoot guns, or pop off fireworks. Have big that family that's barbecue. That's it. Sit, sit back and sit back and just enjoy the day. Sometimes that's a, one of the best ways to enjoy your freedoms. You just sit back and enjoy it. That is um, actually a good point too about the fireworks. Is we can't do fireworks up here either it's something that we hardly ever are able to do up here in alaska because this time of year i mean we just had the summer solstice so it's still really light out like we we are lucky if we were able to get um fireworks we normally have it on black friday because we do that's the santa coming to town thing we then we normally have them on new year's uh new year's eve uh, at the start of the new year that's about it that's the only time we really have fireworks up here hmm. that's I, I never thought of that Actually, with you, with you being in Alaska and just being on the the north the northern he- well super northern hemisphere and the way that the 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 sun shines and how it's always dark, especially in the winter, like you get like what one or two or three hours of sunlight maybe during the winter and stuff like that, especially depending on where you are. But to not be able to have fireworks because it's not even dark enough to see them, I never actually thought yeah. of that. But anyways, guys, so today very fun topic of discussion. Eric and I are going to go head to head and Eric actually has a spreadsheet 
it's kind of lined out for everybody to visualize, especially if you're watching this live after the fact. If you if you're not watching after the fact, it's gonna be a little bit difficult to follow along. Make sure you go back and check it, this show out on YouTube so you can see what we're actually looking at. But anyways, we're going to look through the entire 90 man roster and build the Broncos 53 man opening day roster as well as the 12 man practice squad. So guys, before we get into this discussion, first things first. Make sure you guys are following the show on Twitter at DVDD underscore pod. You guys can follow me and Eric on Twitter as well. You can follow me at Sanderson MHH and for Eric at Eric Trickle. Notice the CK and Eric and the EL and Trickle. Uh, also, head on over to huddleuppod.com. If you guys have a chance, if you guys are financially able of uh, doing so, get yourself a hat, get yourself a T-shirt. There's a coffee cup. There's a face mask, a bunch of hoodies, something for everybody, some guy stuff, some girl stuff out there. Um, it's a really great way to support the show and help everybody kind of see what we're doing here. Uh, but if you're not able to do so, the three easiest things that you guys can do is subscribe wherever you're watching this on YouTube specifically, uh, looking to reach that 10,000 subscriber mark here soon. Uh, if you're, it, if you like any of the videos, that's a great way to help. And if you really love what we're doing, share it out to everybody in Broncos country. This is the overtime podcast network. Now, Eric, the biggest thing that we're going to go through here with this, with the 53 man roster projection is more so, or the, the depth players on this thing. Yeah. Obviously, like every roster in the NFL has 40 guys, uh, roughly 40 guys that is, they're like locks to make the roster. Like there, there's a little bit of discussion towards the end of that, but really there's 40 guys that every team, you know, that they are going to make the roster. I got a list out here. And then after that, there's a big discussion. That how is everybody going to fit into this roster? What kind of of, uh, what kind of defensive personnel you're looking at? What kind of offensive personnel? Who's going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, who's going to be able to offer the most versatility, play multiple roles within the defense, uh, special teams versatility, stuff like that, and then build your practice squad based off of that. Now, to get into the conversation at hand, I have my 40 locks scheduled up to make the roster. And starting off, obviously, the quarterback position is the most important position in all of sports. The Denver Broncos obviously have Drew Locke and then Jeff Driscoll. They signed to a free agent contract earlier this year to be the backup. Now, outside of that, is there anybody really that you're looking at to make this roster? Um, At quarterback, it's definitely going to be interesting and just because with what's going on in the world, with I mean, not just the Broncos, but every team, typically two, three quarterbacks is the norm with a lot of teams wanting just two. But wanting to keep three a little bit this year with everything that's going on might be a little bit safer that way. So it's going to be very interesting for that, not just quarterbacks, for a bunch of other positions. And I will say this, that because of this factor, cutting the preseason games down by two games, there's now talk that they're going to cut down the rosters for training camp from 90 to 75 or 80. So it's going to be a lot of interesting stuff to see. And it's going to definitely reflect on the stuff Valley Deep Divers thing. And, but yeah, outside of lock at quarterback, I really don't see a, a, for sure lock, I guess, at quarterback to make this. But real quick, guys, I'm going to go ahead and add the thing to the stream, and I'm going to be basically focused on that. So if I miss something in chat, Lance, you're going to have to bring it up and mention it to me. So, all right, I'm going to add it to the stream. Hope you guys can see it. Um, We do have every position on here. I just have to scroll and everything. had to make it nice and big so you guys can go ahead and see that. So I think since we were talking about it already, it's, it's safe to move over, Drew Lock, right? Yeah. All right. Now, are we going to keep um, – I guess the next part of the conversation is – make that black – is who else makes it? I mean, as we talked about, is no one else is a lock. They did bring in Jeff Driscoll to be that backup quarterback, but he's more of a number three. Is Brett Rippon going to step up? Like, who, who are you thinking for the number two quarterback? Well, to me, just based off the money that they gave Jeff Driscoll in the offseason to come back, and that was pretty much the idea, was that he was going to be the backup quarterback. He wasn't going to threaten Drew Locke in any way for the starting gig. He's going to be at least a reliable guy, has some experience not only in Cincinnati, but also last year with the with the Detroit Lions as well. So that's the guy that I'm looking at to make the roster as, as far as that's a lock to me. Jeff Driscoll is going to be the lock. Now it's a very interesting conversation, especially with what's going on in the world regarding Brett Rippon here. And Brett Rippon made the practice squad last year, undrafted free agent out of Boise state. But at the same time, 
that's your kind of emergency guy. At least Jeff Driscoll does have some NFL experience. Brett Rippon, as of this point, has never even played in a single game. I mean, he has some pri- uh, some preseason reps, but he's never actually played in an actual NFL live action game. Jeff Driscoll at least offers you that and can come in and, again, not offer any kind of true threat to Drew Locke in being the starting quarterback. Yeah, I definitely agree. Is um as much as I want Brett Rippon to be able to beat out Jeff Driscoll, I don't see it happening. I think cutting back the preseason is going to put a put basically a, completely hamper that from even happening, hinder that from happening. So I'm actually with you. I think Jeff Driscoll is the number two quarterback for this. And then the conversation becomes: Is do we keep? Do we just keep three quarterbacks or just two quarterbacks? And that's where that's where it's kind of weird, just with everything that's going on. To me, I don't necessarily want to keep a third quarterback on the roster immediately to start the season, just because that's a that's a position you're going to sit him down. He's going to be a game day inactive for the most part, unless something happens to say Drew Lock. Maybe potentially he twists an ankle or he has a thumb injury like he had last year, or Jeff Driscoll. Whatever may potentially happen, you know, you, you can't ever actually project injuries correctly but to me that third quarterback he's not actually going to even be dressed on game days that that particular spot would be more suited to go to like an offensive lineman maybe an extra wide receiver maybe an extra cornerback or defensive back maybe even get an extra defensive lineman in the fold there so to me Brett Rippon is probably the first guy and I actually have him we'll get to this in just a little bit I actually have Brett Rippon making the practice squad for this team and not making the opening day roster see Originally, I, I've thought about that, but looking at what has been kind of the preference for Pat Shermer, and I mean from last year and John Elway for most of his career, most of his career as a GM too, is there's been a lot of three quarterbacks making the roster for the Broncos for Pat Shermer, and I just think that even without what's going on in the world, I think that we'd likely see three quarterbacks, and I think with what's going on in the world that we are. Definitely going to see three quarterbacks make the 53 man roster. So, this comes up to the point of do we put Brett Rippon on there or do we save that spot somewhere else? Because we, we have a difference here. And prior to this, we didn't talk about what we would do if we come to a difference. No, we, we actually I, – so I have my 53-man roster written down. It's one that I used for a, a previous podcast where we did our last four guys on the roster and our first four guys off. And, again, I had Brett Rippon making the practice squad in that exercise. So, to me, let's hold off on that. This is a conversation to come back to after we get into the, the little bit of the depth kind of the players, especially at the cornerback position, especially along the offensive line. There is a very significant dearth of talent along the offensive line. In fact, I only had six guys seven excuse me seven guys that I had as for sure locks to even make the roster so let's come back to this conversation and move on to the to the running back conversation just a little bit now the, the, the first things first, Melvin Gordon, there's no way that the Broncos are going to pay Melvin Gordon $8 million a year and not have him on the roster. Philip Lindsay as well, uh, back-to-back 1,000-yard rushing seasons. The, the Colorado kid, super fan favorite. Those guys are for sure locks to make this roster. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Where do you value Royce Freeman in this fold? Do you actually think that with his receiving ability coming out of the backfield, lining him up out on the outside, a, a little bit as a blocker, but he's not going to be a featured kind of a guy so is that third down kind of a niche role for him enough for him to make the roster in your opinion i don't think it's enough for him to make a roster but again this is going to be repeated on this on this show multiple times with the current state of affairs in the world you're going to keep and lean to keep in that guy who at least have some idea of what he's doing out there i mean granted they're all on equal ground because they're all learning a new offense but at least they've seen Royce Freeman. At least Royce Freeman has been working with them. At least he's been working with Drew Locke. At least he's been working behind a decent amount of these these blockers. So I, I think that he does win this number three job. I think that his receiving ability is enough with what they with everything that's going on to keep him around. And quite frankly, I think that with everything going on, that's all they keep is Royce Freeman, Philip Bunzi, and Melvin Gordon. 
You know, I, I don't disagree with you on that one, but there's also a, a very specific conversation I want to have you with some versatility, especially coming out of the backfield as a receiver and then giving you another option as a kick returner in Levante Bellamy, the undrafted rookie free agent, I believe out of Western Michigan, right? Uh, so Levante Bellamy is a, a dynamic kind of explosive playmaker likes to run on the outside. This is a big deal, though, with Pat Shermer, not liking to run the outside zone, zone stretch. Can Levante Bellamy run between the tackles efficiently? That's actually a good question. I, quite frankly, that's also a question with Royce Freeman because we've seen him where he's supposed to run between the tackles, but he wants to bounce it outside. So it's definitely a question that goes for both. I mean, Bellamy definitely does have a little bit more versatility, but the question comes down to, and I think we're going to see this a lot this year with actual NFL teams making this decision, is do we go with the more unknown who may be a little bit, not necessarily better, but more versatile with maybe a little bit more upside or do we go with the somewhat known guy who we've been working with? And I think that typically we see him then go with the versatile, younger guy, cheaper guy, all that. But I think this year we're going to see a lot of the veterans. Like, I, I really do. I think that this is going to be a – this is Royce Freeman's job basically at this point. And, I mean, as somebody's pointed out in the chat too, is the NFLPA voted to sit there and just do away with the preseason. We already have two games. There's already an impact on how well they can pick up. These rookies can pick up the offense or pick up the playbook period on either side of the ball. It's going to be lead to a lot of issues. And I, for that reason, I really do think that it is Royce Freeman. Yeah, I'm actually with you on that one. Put put Royce Freeman. That was a guy that I have actually had as a lock to make this roster. I just wanted to bring up Levante Bellamy there, and it's not necessarily as the third running back. You might see him a little bit more prominently, especially in that passing attack, if he can show and prove that he is the player that we all think he is capable of as a receiver coming out of the backfield. I I would I would probably wager you're going to see Bellamy on third downs in, in like true actual third down passing scenarios, third and long situations where Bellamy can be like an escape route or a, like a screen play or something like that. That would be where I would rather see him. Honestly, Melvin Gordon is going to be the guy, but still if Levante Bellamy can come in and show that I would prefer to see him there. But with Royce Freeman, Honestly, his pass protection is a lot better than giving credit for. He can line up outside. He can line up and come out of the backfield. The proven veteran here is a guy. Levante Bellaby might be a, a conversation to come back up as we build the tail end of this roster. Now, guys, we're going to pause this conversation really quick and say hello to the chat stream. As Eric had earlier mentioned, James coming in here, uh, Darian P, Terry Randall coming in from Canada with a $2 donation up here. And Darian, I didn't say California. Thank you. Hashtag Eric's tie rocks. Uh, Dylan Von Arks coming in as well. He has a super chat down here. Uh, let me see if I can find it really fast. Thank you. Uh, just showing some love. Hashtag DVDD. Hey, man, we love you, too. We appreciate you guys all showing up. Todd Anderson showing up here in the chat. Again, Darian, uh, let's see here. Robert Caslow coming in. What's up, Broncos country? What's up, man? It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have everybody in the stream tonight. Thank you all for once again for joining the Dove Alley Deep Divers podcast. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Is there any free agent running backs that can replace Royce Freeman? Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I mean, I'd have to I'd have to look at a list just to to even get names. I don't. So at this point, I don't think so. But again, I'm not sure of who all is still available off the top of my head. So yeah, that's that's kind of a difficult question to answer here. Uh, there was another another super chat coming in from Terry uh, up north showing that Broncos country is not a geographic location. It is, in fact, a hashtag state of being a $5 super here. With, uh, will the lack of a full preseason make it riskier to get the roster locks more reps with the bubble guys trying to get seen? Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. will. Uh, the, not necessarily the, the, the full preseason for the, the guys that are roster locks, but the bubble guys is the biggest thing. We're going to see the, the Broncos, and this is something that's coming down from Adam Schefter, that the, all teams across the NFL are going to have to cut their rosters down to 75 or 80 players before, the, the, before any team even sees live action. So how do you actually monitor all 90 guys in, in practice scenarios? And you never know. There is a, a significant thing here to cabin fever. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, Eric to where 
guys get pent up and they're always <laughs> well you do live in alaska so never mind I was gonna say, cabin <laughs> fever is like a term invented up here in alaska <laughs> <laughs> anyway so guys getting cabin fever uh so where they're they're pent up aggression going up against the same guys over and over and over again where they can now they're they're picking little idiosyncrasies that everybody all the players on the roster has i know how to beat you because i can beat you with a swim or a rip specifically against you how do I perform against another player? Now, 15 to 20 guys are going to get, well, at least 15 guys are going to get cut off the off the roster before they ever, even ever get a chance to show that ability against somebody else. So yeah. it's, it's an unfair advantage to guys that are roster locks for sure, especially like go back to Kalfani Muhammad last year. Kalfani Muhammad played so well in the preseason as a running back and had a, a couple of really nice games last year. And he ended up make, uh, making it onto the practice squad. This year, he might not even get an opportunity to compete for the practice squad. Yeah, it's de- it's definitely a shame, everything, that and how much it's affecting it. I mean, hearing that the rosters may go down from 90 to 75 or 80, already 10 players, 10, maybe 15 players, losing that chance before to even, they even really get it. It's just a shame. Definitely not something, not a situation that people want, that every, anybody wants to be in, really. So it's definitely, it definitely just sucks about that. And, but teams are trying to do what the best they can. There's also been um, talk about teams ex- being able to expand the practice mm-hmm. squad for this year, additionally, because of having to deal with all those issues, um, with the current events going on in the world and people getting, getting it, I guess would be the best way to put it. But also just giving some of these guys who have a, lack of chance a better chance uh yeah. being able to sit there and give them hey yeah well we liked you sucks what happened but we're, you're gonna get another shot next year so it's definitely gonna be curious, interesting to see how everything goes going forward and everything um but and then i also saw this going out there that there's a lot of questions about why they did the 53 and being able to call two up without just going straight 55 i don't know makes no sense i think that is the dumbest thing in the world Basically, all only good thing that it does and it means you don't have to keep a kick return specialist. You don't have to keep a fullback. You don't have to keep certain positions like that that you don't may not use a lot or um, doesn't have that wide of a role because then you can sit there and just put them on there, call them up every week. But if an injury happens, you can go and bring them, bring somebody else up. Just a little bit more options, but I still think it's stupid. Yeah. It, some of the, the the less specific role, well, more specific role like that, like that third quarterback. You don't have to keep that third quarterback on the roster because you can snatch him on the practice squad and then bring him up for a game day. Now, let's get back to the conversation at hand. Eric, you want to pull that back up there? You have the wide receivers pulled up next. And this is pretty well uh, an easy, at least for the top four guys. Uh, Cortland Sutton is potentially a top five wide receiver in the NFL. There's very little question about that. I mean, he's going to be a guy that is just a, a, an amazing player for the Broncos, and hopefully they can figure out a way to keep him in, for, in Denver for the long haul. Jerry Judy, obviously the first-round pick in, in 2020. There's no way he doesn't make the roster. K.J. Hamler, second-round pick as well. There's no way he doesn't make the roster. This is where it kind of gets interesting. And to me, the guy that I'm going to put on the roster, just specifically because he has some special teams versatility, offers a, a backup role to Cortland Sutton specifically, is Tim Patrick. Uh, what is third year player out of uh, Florida State, I believe. Uh, anyways, so the 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 fact that he plays special teams at such a high level has some uh, has some familiarity with the offense with Drew Locke as well. That's the the fourth guy I'm, uh, I have making this roster right now. Eric, do you see any reason why Tim Patrick shouldn't make the roster? Injuries. That's basically it. When he, I mean, going back to Utah, not Florida State. Oh, by excuse the way. me. Um, he he's dealt with injuries very often in his career. But I think that there, as you said, he offers enough as on special teams. He is the best direct um, depth piece for Cortland Sutton because they are somewhat similar that it's easier to insert him there. If something happens to Cortland Sutton, knock on wood, but I think that's enough to make him stay. But yeah, injuries are the only thing that really comes up. I mean, Denver, they definitely are going to sit there and do what they can because Last year, they just didn't get enough out of him. They didn't get enough out of Deshaun Hamilton. They didn't get enough out of the receivers not named Cortland Sutton, period. So they're going to be looking for all this. I think that outside of the first three spots with Sutton, Judy, and Hamler, I think it's all open. It's all open for a battle. They're all going to let them fight it out. So it's 
But then the thing is, is as we've mentioned, with everything going on in the world, I think Tim Patrick's experience is going to help boost him up a little bit. I mean, especially over the fact that Trinity Benson, he's only had preseason last year. Terry Cleveland's a rookie. Kendall Hinton's a rookie. Samari Manning's a, mo- a rookie. Kelvin McKnight, he's a guy who he only had preseason last year. Deontay Spencer, who we've seen that he is, can't really contribute on offense. And then you also see Jawan Winfrey, who... What is he at this point? He uh, he made some plays in the preseason, but not to the consistency or anything. So he definitely has a leg up on that. Yeah, Juwan Winfrey would be really, really ideal back in the 60s as a blocking wide receiver because he's a tremendous blocker. Outside of that, he's like non-impactful at all. Now, going to this fifth wide receiver, there's a, a very interesting conversation here between Deshaun Hamilton and Tyree Cleveland. Now, Eric, you actually brought up to us before we were, uh, to me and uh, Bawana, who's behind the scenes here, about some Tyree Cleveland workout videos that has been circulating around social uh, social media. What can you speak on that really fast? Yeah, there's a couple of them that have uh, popped up on my timeline that I've actually been very curious about and have been watching everything, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, he definitely looks a lot better than what he did prior to the draft. I mean, some of his routes, they're looking a little bit crisper. His route work there, his feet are looking a little bit crisper. So it's going to be very interesting to see how that's going to able to translate into the preseason with only two games. If he's able to make a spot for it, he has, um, he has proven that he can play on special teams as well, which is adding to his value. And I definitely think that he is one of the three, four, maybe even five receivers out of this bunch that is fighting for that receiver four, five, six spots. And I do think that Denver keeps six receivers with yeah. that six one kind of being that special teamer returner type guy who I know a couple weeks ago I said that Deontay Spencer really shouldn't make this roster. And I stand by that. I think that with the pre, with the practice squad being able to call up to, I definitely don't think that Deontay Spencer should make it. You could just call him up. He's not offering up much on offense, so you don't really need him for that. Just You just need him for return duty. That's about it. But because of the situation going on with it, I think that he is going to sit here. I think he's going to make the roster, and I think that it's going to be because he's just, I guess, safe, for lack of a better term, because he's he just knows what he needs to do. You don't want to risk it. You don't want to risk him getting picked up by somebody else at this point. Before everything going on, before the whole – well, not before everything going on, but before the situation has changed with the preseason, I think that his chances of getting picked up by somebody else were a lot lower than they are now because teams would have had four games multiple um, and practices and all this stuff like that to try and find their returner, and now they don't. Yeah. So I think that – I do think that he makes it. So just to wrap this up here and get over to tight ends – in my opinion, I think that the last two that we that are going to make this roster is Deshaun Hamilton because he has experience with Drew Locke. He started to show up those last two games wanting to see if he can do it a little bit. And Deontay Spencer. I actually agree with Deshaun Hamilton uh, 100% just because, again, go back to the veteran. You know what he's going to, you know what he's going to do for you. I wish he would give you a little bit more special teams versatility, which is why I really lean Tyree Cleveland here. But if nothing else, you're going to put Tyree Cleveland on the practice squad. And if he continues to produce, uh, to improve, excuse me, his route running ability, he might be able to take over for Deshaun Hamilton, especially because he offers a little bit more athleticism, especially vertically down the field. Now, Deontay Spencer, just because he is the, the veteran punt returner on this team, we, we saw it a lot last year. And every single game, I swear, I was saying, he's going to break one. He's going to get one to the house. Just You, you watch the jitterbug aspect of him. He had a, a couple of very explosive returns at the punt returner last year. We don't know with Tyree Cleveland right now. And there's a lot of unknowns to go with that. Seventh round pick. Give me the guy that's been on the roster. Deontay Spencer, put him in there. All right, and I do want to come back to this because there was one comment you made. I'm trying to pull it up now before we move on real quick. And it had to do with Deshaun Hamilton and his play on being able to play on special teams. So just one second here because I think that he played a little bit there the last two years and actually looked pretty, like, I don't want to say great, but he looked decent, I think. Um, Hold on. I'm just having some issues with pro football focus. Oh, you're fine. I'm going to pull up a super chat really fast from Joey Richards. Our boy JR Drafts coming in here with a $10 super chat. Appreciate the hard work, guys. Hey, we appreciate you, man. You guys push us to to be the best that we can be. And, Joey, if you ever do get a chance to, to get some free time, hit us up. Come back on the show. We'd love to have you, man. We, we really would love to have you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, JR Drafts, I mean, keep – He's a great follow, guys. He does a lot of film stuff out there. Definitely worth following. 
uh, dude's very enlightening with what he takes and everything like that. Just an awesome follow, especially if you want to learn more about like having plays break broken down for you and everything. Definitely a guy. But um, anyways, getting back to Deshaun Hamilton real quick is he only he only played one total snap on special teams last year. It was his rookie year that he played on it, and he actually looked pretty solid. He was on coverage units and he looked decent. Um, I mean, he was on kick coverage um, a little bit, and he was on. Uh, the return groups a little bit and he looks solid. I mean, he has a good gunner option. Uh, I mean, he can make it. It would be interesting to see, but I definitely think he has the potential to continue to add on for special teams going forward as well. So I don't think we should be writing him off for special teams just yet. This is the overtime podcast network. Yeah. And that's, that's fair, but that's what you want to see from your fifth and sixth wide receiver, especially your sixth wide receiver, especially if it's going to be a Deontay Spencer who you're keeping on specifically as that return guy, your fifth wide receiver is probably not going to see the field a lot, especially being De- uh, Deshaun Hamilton and coming in with KJ Hamler, who is there directly to take your job. Yeah. Like and- now Deshaun Hamilton has to come out and be a quality special teams player this yeah. year. If he wants to see the field pretty much at all. And if he does get to see the field on the offensive side of the football it's not going to be in a, a role that where they're going to target him very often. They just haven't done so. It, uh, he gets open a lot. He's a great route runner, but with Drew Locke, he actually kind of stepped up a little bit towards the end of the season. But I don't think that it like going even to his rookie year, he was primarily used as a as a a, a blocker. And Deshaun yeah. Hamilton's a hell of a blocker. Yeah, he is. That is definitely what he does best. And another thing too is going back to Spencer a little bit is. Over the last couple weeks, ever since I mentioned about him not how he shouldn't make the roster a couple weeks ago, I've had to deal with this a lot about people saying, "Well, Fangio, well, Fangio uh, backed him up. Well, Fangio threw all his support behind him. Blah 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 blah." That's great. Quarter or coaches throw their support behind players all the time that end up not making it. Yep. What they're not going to sit there and tear him down publicly. And there was a recent article from the Denver on the Denver Broncos website just recently that with how it was worded and everything and what was said, it made it very clear that it wasn't Deontay Spencer's job. Like that, he still had to go out there and earn it. It made it very clear that he is not being handed the job. That he does have competition from multiple players, including KJ Hamler. Even though at one point Fangio said that they don't really want to use him on returns. Well, yep. this article made it very clear that they do, and it was taking comments from multiple coaches as well. So saying that it's Deontay Spencer, like just because of what I mean, because Fangio endorsed him, like. It's not, it's not enough. Like you got to go out there and earn it. And that's what he is. And I think at this point with preseason cut down to two games, I think he has the edge to go out there and earn it because with KJ Hamler, with guys like Trinity Benson, with Kendall Hinton, Zamari Manning, those guys who they need to go out there and try and show that they still have to go and show up on offense. They still have to learn that at least with Deontay Spencer, you know, he's not going to be a receiver. You know, he's just a returner. He can go and focus on that. Whereas all the, everybody else, as I said, they have to focus on two things. So help ease up the plate for these rookies and young guys a little bit too. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right there. Uh, Malcolm Brown coming in with a super chat here. Did the content from the draft days ever get posted? Those were my favorite episodes and the fan contributions were great. Hashtags Eric, hashtag Eric's tie dye fund. <laughs> all, all that stuff anything on mile high huddle you can find it all on youtube go back and, and yeah. check it out um honestly if you search dove valley deep divers on youtube you will find every single episode with me and eric on it uh, well even without me because i've missed a, a bunch over the last you know two or three months just trying to go home and see my family but anything dove valley deep divers anything really uh, search a specific uh, a specific podcast on youtube and you'll find every single episode in chronological order actually yeah, and I do. I want to throw this out there too. With from DW, thank you for joining us. He says, "I don't keep Spencer when he offers nothing more than punt return. It's not like he's Dante Hall. Let Hamler or someone else." Do the, I'm actually with you on that. That's yeah. my main point. That's what I made. My main point was a couple weeks ago. My issue is, is now. I mean, with Hamler, he's still got to learn the offense. I yeah. think that with two preseason games, with the impact that's going to be coming with training camp and all this other stuff, I think that the team is going to want KJ Hamler to just focus on offense and just let Deontay Spencer continue to be your return guy. I think that's how it's going to be. I don't agree with it. I think being able to call up two people is just so beneficial for Deontay Spencer not having him on it. But it is what it is. And we'll see here in a little little over a month, actually. about two. Well, actually, about two months, really. And... Welcome to the show, Chrissy. Hey, hey, glad you're here. Glad you can make it. 
Hey, it's the queen of Mile High Huddle and the Huddle Up podcast. Christy, what's up, girl? How you doing? All right, so let's move this conversation for. Uh, wait, as clarif- uh, James coming in here as a, as a clarification, is this what you would do or what you think the Broncos would do? Um, this is actually what I would do. What I, what I'm talking about is what I would do, Eric. I'm not sure how you're talking here. I'm looking at it as a little bit of both because obviously there's going to be some of my opinions on what they should do in this, but I'm also looking at it like with. Deontay Spencer, like with Brett Rippon making the roster, is there are some moves that are going to be that I think that the Broncos will do because just from reading between the lines with all these comments from teams, with what reporters are saying, with the changes that are coming on because of everything that's going on in the world, that we kind of have to factor that in. Like, I really do think that every team this year will keep three quarterbacks on their practice squad and a four or three quarterbacks on the roster and a fourth one on their practice squad because if one, if your starter gets sick, then you're going to want a guy who you've been working with to come in and do that because then you have to worry about your number two quarterback getting sick and your number three quarterback getting sick. And it's much easier to bring up a guy who's already been with the team, either on the roster or the practice squad and bring that up. I think that, I mean, we might even see some teams do two and two. That's a possibility as well. Yeah. But I really do think that there'll be four, four quarterbacks kept on teams between their 53 men roster and their practice squad. And that's a very interesting way of looking at it. And again, it, just with where I'm at, we don't see the 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 word that shall not be ma- named impact nearly as much around here. So I don't necessarily think about that. I think about specifically football all day, more or less. But uh, anyway, so, so to go into that kind of an aspect and people getting sick, people not getting sick, like where do you go? I don't really know. <laughs> so I'm looking at this as trying to build the, the best 53-man roster. And to me, keeping that third quarterback is not that. Now, yeah. to move this forward just a little bit, uh, to build the tight well, ends up here. We do got to go back and talk about the third quarterback, too. Yeah, we do actually have to go back and talk and about that. Real quick, it, Robert, actually, there were like a few teams, not recently, it was like 10 plus years ago, where keeping four quarterbacks was actually somewhat normal. Yeah. So. Yes, it was. All right, now, to, we're at 35 minutes here, and we wanted to try to have a very nice and deep dive episode for you, but we got to move this forward or else we're going to go into like four hours on this. Now, so, let's come back to the quarterback before we get to tight end. Okay. Because we, we got to get this figured out. Brett Rippin, chat, let us know what do you guys think. Brett Rippin, make it. Brett Rippin to the practice squad. I, I'm pounding the table. Not necessarily pounding the table. I don't like that term really. Well, outside of the draft, it's weird. But um, I'm going I'm to be kind of putting my foot down on this. I, I really do think that Brett Rippon makes it. And if I'm even considering what I would do with the situation situation going on in the world, I would keep three quarterbacks. I would keep Brett Rippon. That's how I would do it, is he would make this 53-man roster. I just think that if you're going to have a guy that that's going to be a game day inactive and you're going to call up another but player. Is he, though? I don't a, think he will be a game day inactive necessarily. Man, that's a that's such a rabbit hole that we can go down in a conversation that I don't even know if we have time for on this podcast. Yeah. I don't know, man. It, 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 that's such a – but And then here's the other thing, too, that we have to factor in is because Rippon has been in the NFL. He's had a year in it. Yep. He's going to be valued over rookie quarterbacks, which is what teams typically want to keep on their their practice squad or as their number 3 quarterback. A lot of teams are going to want to, other teams are going to want to keep number 3 quarterbacks. There's been a few teams that have actually coaches who basically have come out and said that yeah, we'll be keeping three quarterbacks and a fourth one on the practice squad. Not in that wording, but they've kind of talked around it a little bit. So, another factor is too is if you're cutting Brett Rippon one of those teams are going to probably pick him up because he has the experience. He's got to work with the with um, Pat Shermer at least for an off season a little bit. Got to work with Rick Scangarello, which that is in a way a boost a little bit. So, I mean, you have to worry about that too. And then what's ever going to do? Keep Riley Neal? Oof. I don't know, man. You just you, you rarely see guys get picked up off the waiver wire to put on uh, to put onto somebody's practice squad. So, well, well it's just not even, not even put, well, it's not even to put them on the on the on the practice squad. It's it's a it, like if we're going down to cut downs here, if that's what we're talking about, just going straight to cut downs. If you're picking up a guy on the waiver wire, you have to put him on the active roster. Yeah, is Brett Rippin making an active roster in the NFL yes. anywhere? I think he will because I think a lot of teams will want to keep a third quarterback. And with Brett Rippon, he's going to be better than what a lot of other teams have as that third quarterback. I think that there will be teams that will pick him up and claim him. Hmm. And 
as for not happening all that often, you're, you're not wrong, really. But, I mean, Denver just picked up three guys off of waiver wire last year. Yeah, off the waiver wire in the like over the course of the season, they put them on the. No, they picked them up right before the thing. Deontay Spencer. Oh yeah, that's true. That's they right. picked up Andrew Beck, and they picked up. Um... Oh, who's the other one? Brandon Allen, wasn't it? No, it wasn't Brandon Allen. Was it Brandon Allen? I can't remember who might, it was, but they picked up three guys. Oh, Devonta Harris, that's who it was. Oh okay. Or was it four? And De- Brandon Allen. I thought they picked up Brandon Allen. Via waivers uh, too. Chet, do, what do you guys remember about that? Did Denver end yeah. up picking up four and not just three? Yeah. Anyways. Anyway. Uh, well, yeah. The, it, it, again, this this is going down to how do, how do you build the 53-man roster? And, and given the, the current situation of affairs that's going on in the world right now, Brett Rippon to the 53-man roster, the way you're kind of not really persuading me, but the way you're laying out your points – is kind of making me lean towards putting yeah. Brett Rippon on the onto the actual, but that that ruins my practice squad. <laughs> and then here's the other thing too with that is, um, I thought Allen was a was a late cut for the Rams right when they were cutting down to their 53 and Denver put in a, yep. a waiver claim for him. So I think it is I think it is Allen Harris, um, Beck and Spencer, all four of whom had a somewhat big impact for the Broncos last year. But additionally too, when you're looking at this, is you want to talk about players who are for inactive. Who are you going to keep? Okay, you don't have that number three quarterback. Who's taking that spot? Say a seventh defensive lineman who's probably going to be inactive. Well, you have a to have eight. You have or, to have eight offensive linemen now. Eight active offensive linemen, but that's going to come. I mean, most teams typically keep seven or eight, anyways. But like, I mean, you're going to end up taking some from somewhere else and having them inactive, anyways. So, yeah, I think that in a normal year, I would completely agree with you, Brett Rippin, straight to the practice squad. Yeah, this year. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Let's go to the tight end position. I'm tired of talking about the quarterbacks. Damn it! <laughs> so, right up into the 53. Sure, why not? <laughs> I'll agree with you just to end this co- this part of the conversation. <laughs> All, right. All right. Now the, the the tight end position. This is pretty easy, at least for the top three. You've got Noah Fant, who is uh, on a potential breakout campaign this year, coming up to be one of the best young tight ends in the NFL. Uh, probably one of the best tight ends in the AFC, actually. You have Nick Vanette, who the Broncos went out and signed to a not really a big money deal, but they gave him way more money than he ever should have gotten. And they went out and drafted Albert Okwegbanam in the third, uh, excuse me, the fourth round of the 2020 NFL draft. Those are your three guys that are locks to make the roster. I don't think that there's any question about that. Um, Okwegbanam, maybe, but you don't spend that kind of a capital on a guy. Um, to to put him, I don't even know if he actually if he clears waivers. That might be a guy that a team will pick up and and bring on and put him on the active roster. So to me, given the fourth round pick, given the the familiarity with Drew Locke, uh, given the need to have another tight end on the roster, just as it is right now, uh, Alberto makes it to me. Um, outside of that. This is where the conversation gets tricky, and that's between Andrew Beck and what do you do with Andrew Beck? Well, I definitely agree. Noah, Noah Fant, Nick Vennett, and Albert Okawebanam, they make it. I think that there's been there's a lot there's been a lot of stuff coming out. The Okawebanam was being looked at in the third round by a few teams, but they just picked somebody who they had a little bit higher rated. That there were people, a lot of people who were surprised that he didn't make it out of the second round. So I think there's enough love for him that you you don't want to risk him on waivers. Now, for me, I think this is it. I don't think that we see a fourth tight end. And the biggest reason is as much as I want to put Andrew Beck on this 53 man roster, guess what? You can call him up off the practice squad. Like if he get if he gets picked up off the pra- off of waivers, oh well. I mean, then you can just go and put Austin Fort on the practice squad who can do kind of the same thing and just call him up then. Or you can get because you can put Jake Butt down there and hopefully finally get something out of him or Troy Fumagalli, is there's just enough tight ends here that I don't think worrying about Andrew Beck being claimed off of waivers is enough of a reason to just put him on the practice, to put him on the roster, I mean. So I think that the three tight ends is all that makes it. Everybody else is going to compete for the practice squad with the edge going to Andrew Beck. Yeah, I I don't disagree with that. The one thing that I will interject with here is Austin Fort, my guy out of Wyoming. Man, last year what he was doing in the preseason, getting first team reps, the the tight end position last year with Noah Fant. I let's see, Jeff Hireman was dinged up. You had Jake Butt coming off an injury. Troy Fumagalli was not playing very well. Austin Fort 
actually came in and was playing some pretty premium snaps in, in training camp. That's a guy that maybe watch out for to make at least the practice squad. Andrew Beck, if he does make the practice squad, I don't think he's going to make the 53-man roster. He's probably going to make the practice squad. But Austin Fort is another guy to watch out for. If Andrew Beck does actually make the opening day roster, watch for Austin Fort to make the to make the practice squad this year. The, the torn ACL really derailed what he was doing last year. Yeah, I definitely agree. And that's one reason why – with Austin Fort, with what we saw from him last year before he got hurt, that's another reason why I'm fine not putting Andrew Beck on the roster. I don't think Austin Fort's at all in risk of getting claimed. I really don't. Because of the injury and everything like that, he has so little tape out there. I mean, what? He only played in two games last preseason, maybe three. I can't remember what game he got hurt. It was and so he's going to have, he's gonna have two this year, against- maybe. Uh, excuse what? me. It was, it was the second game against Seattle was where Austin okay. Fort tore, tore his ACL. So yeah, I don't think that he is, that he's at risk of getting hurt. So I'm all for if putting him on there, or I mean, putting uh, leaving him off of here and just seeing what happens with Andrew Beck. And if Andrew Beck gets claimed, then Austin Fort or Jake Butt or Troy Fumagalli. So that's the way I'm leaning, leaving it as it is, letting yeah. these other five tight ends go in and compete for the uh, practice squad. Yeah, no, I'm totally in, in agreement with that. Now moving on to the offensive line here, oh, it's... let's get to chat for a little bit. Oh yeah, absolutely here. <laughs> Uh, James actually came in and, and corrected both of us here uh, and said yeah. the, the guys that were claimed by the by the Broncos last year was center Corey Levine, who was waived by the Titans, Andrew Beck waived by the Pats, Deontay Spencer waived by the Steelers, who actually was the, the punt returner, uh, and Brandon Allen, who was waived by the Rams. So, James, thank you for going back and fact-checking us on that one. I appreciate yep. that. Um, Devonta Harris ended up being signed just a couple days later. Yes, uh, Biggie Bronco coming in and says, Lance, stop being an old boy and just put Rippin on the 53. Hey, easy, <laughs> man. I'm only 29. I'm not that old. Damn. Older than uh, me. The <laughs> uh, James Campbell coming in. For all intents and purposes, though, Beck Fumigali Fort as the call-up guy is fair enough. I saw a pretty spicy take by Cameron Parker that had Butt emerging as the tight end, too. Now, This is an interesting conversation here because I was extremely high on Jake Budd coming out of Michigan. The ACL tear that he had in, was it the Fiesta Bowl? The orange, whatever bowl game that it was that he blew his, it blew his ACL up. He was a first round pick that year. And it like, there was no doubt he was, he was most likely a first round pick. And the, the injury that he had really derailed that, obviously. To be a fifth-round pick by the Broncos, I was pounding the table. This was before my time at Mile High Huddle. I was pounding the table for the Broncos to take a flyer on Jake Butt because if he came back healthy and could actually play, you've got a quality blocker, a guy that can work over the middle of the field, has a very nice catch radius, very smooth and sweet hands, a very good player. This is not necessarily 2017 anymore, though. The, the Broncos have a plethora of talented tight ends, and Jake Butt is really going to have to work his butt off, to, no pun intended, to be, even be able to think about the practice squad. Yeah. He spent two seasons on IR. I definitely agree. I mean, it's just it's a shame because he does have so much potential, so much talent there that he just hasn't been able to do anything with it because he hasn't been healthy. And it, it sucks, I mean, to be in that position. Here, here you are trying to achieve your dreams, and you can't stay healthy enough to do so. Yeah. But, I mean, it's a part of life in the NFL. you got to overcome it. you got to deal with it. This is his last chance, I think, to do it. And I don't think he has to do a whole lot to make the practice squad, per se. I think he just has to show he can be healthy and contribute. That's about it. And I think that he's in a decent position to do just that. Honestly, and this might be a hot take, and this might be where uh, the comment was coming from. If Jake Butt is healthy and can play at the, the the level that we saw him at Michigan, can he beat out Nick Vanette? I mean, he's at least as good of a blocker as Nick Vanette. He's a better receiver than Nick Vanette. Can he pretend – if he's healthy, If uh, that's the biggest thing, is if he is healthy, does he beat out Nick Vanette for tight end too? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I'm going to say no, as much, I think I would, I would like to see it, but I just don't see it happening. So yeah, I'm going to say no, I don't think he can beat out Nick Bennett. 
Um, I think if anybody's going to beat out Nick Vendett, I think it's going to be his former Ohio State teammate in Jeff Hireman. Yeah, that's a that's a fair argument there. I don't know. Jeff Hireman's such a likely cut candidate, though, with the with the amount of money that the Broncos owe him. He he should have been released a long time ago. Honestly, they never should have brought Nick Vanette in the first place. They should have just kept Jeff Hireman, let him do what he does. But I don't know, man. Jake Butt, that's Jay Booty. That's my boy. I'm telling you. All right, Robert Caswell coming in. Who are your who are the candidates for special teams with wide receivers? Uh, we kind of broke this down just a little bit. Um, to me, you're going to see Tim Patrick, obviously, Deshaun Hamilton, since he's made the roster here, uh, being a gunner there. Yeah, the the guys that could, could potentially upseat those guys, Fred Brown might be a guy to talk about. Um, Kelvin McKnight maybe as well. Um, who else, Eric? So the receivers that I think that are that have special teams value – in terms of receiving ability is Trinity Benson, Kendall Hinton, Zamari Manning, and Kelvin McKnight. And on top of Spencer and Hamler, of course. Those are the guys I'm looking at for returner. Maybe Tyree Cleveland a little bit. Um, Cleveland, Hamilton, again, Hinton, Manning, Benson, McKnight, all these guys. They also have ability as a gunner. Um, Spencer's a little bit too small for a gunner, a little bit too light. So I have some issues doing that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, a good number of them have that potential on special teams that they just have to make their impact there before they can make this roster. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Now, where are we? We are at we, the offensive tackle position, right? Yep, well, we're going gonna, we're gonna to get through this offensive line, and then we're going to go back to the chat for a little bit, and then we're going to go do the defensive line and edge, go back to the chat for a little bit, probably – well, actually, defensive line, edge, and linebacker chat. Then do cornerback safeties, go back to the chat, and then special teams because I know that's what everybody cares about and practice. <laughs> yeah, this is hey, gonna punters be a- are people too, man. Punters are people too. There's only one punter right now, Sam Martin. Okay, long snappers are people too then. There you go. That's the one we need to talk that's about. The one, that's the battle everybody wants to hear about. The battle between Jacob Bobbin Moyer and Wes Farnsworth. Yeah, yeah. I'm about it, man. Uh, which one? Which one can snap the football over their head and hit a dinner plate at, at 25 yards? That's what I want to know. Hey, man, have you tried long snapping? I have actually. I it's would- actually quite hard. Like, there's a lot to it that that like we make jokes and everything, but there is quite a bit to it. I, I actually tried out to to be the long snapper when I was in high school, and <laughs> it was not pretty. Let's just put it. It's very hard to do. You, you got to understand the, the strength and the velocity you got to get on the football, the accuracy as well, and you're also looking between your legs and upside down and, and yeah. v- vulnerable in every way, shape, or form. And then it's, it's incredibly hard to be a long snapper. And don't timing hate. Is so, timing is so critical to it, too. Like, that's the biggest thing is if you are off by just a split second, your field goal might be getting blocked. Your punt yep. might be getting blocked. Like your yep. timing has to be boom, boom, boom. It's it's, it's why it's why teams so often when they find a good long snapper that they can hold that is so good that they hold on to him for so long. Who was that guy that was the long snapper for the Raiders for the longest time? If I actually asked my buddy Justin, he would be able to tell me. Oh. Uh, he was like like twelve or thirteen years the long yeah. snapper. Like that's the greatest gig in the NFL. Which is it's either ironic. the, the either it's the, ironic. the third string quarterback or the long snapper. Like you make you might not make millions and millions of dollars being a long snapper, but you will make at least a solid living for your yeah. entire life. If you're a quality long snapper, you'll make seven hundred fifty thousand dollars a year just to snap the football three times a game. And yeah. you're perfect. Like that's that's great. And then um, additionally about that, it's ironic that you mentioned the Raiders because there is the game that shows the most importance for a, for right. a long snapper is, is a Raiders Chargers game from a few years ago because there were so many bad snaps on that because they didn't have their long snapper got hurt. Yeah, the long like snapper the got long hurt snapper on got a punt cover. The Chargers long snapper got hurt. So they had somebody who's not a long snapper snapping the ball. Like, yeah. Like, uh, there you go. Anyway, LP, <laughs> LP Leducer has been the long uh, the Cowboys long snapper since 2005. There you go. Prime example. You got to have a, a quality long snapper. This is right, the, guys, this, we'll is get, the we'll <laughs> this is we'll, the tweet. This is the tweet. Come back to long snappers. <laughs> All right, now getting to the offensive line, I, I believe you have the offensive tackles pulled up right now. Uh, easily, uh, Garrett Bowles and Juwan James. Those guys are locks to make the roster. Garrett Bowles. I hate to, the fact that we have to say his name on this podcast. I'm really tired of having to do so, but 
regardless. Uh, he's your starting left tackle. Juwan James, if he's healthy, is your starting right tackle. Mm-hmm. Oh wait! Uh, quickly, we got Mark Langley coming in with a with a five dollar super. Eric should be the mental therapist for hashtag use toilet bowls, <laughs> hashtag seventy two flushes and flushes and uh, turd ain't one. Oh, 72 flushes in a turd ain't one. Uh, hashtag <laughs> mile high huddle. Hashtag Dove Valley deep divers. Hashtag orange crush. Hashtag Broncos country. Now, Mark, you and your your bulls puns, man. <laughs> You and I are going to have to have a conversation. I'm telling you, I listen to you all the time on the the Huddle Up podcast and your amazingly funny tweets. But, dude, it's getting old, man. Stop it. <laughs> it's funny to me. And I got I to gotta admit, man, I really like the, the Deep Valley Dove Divers, man. I like that. That's awesome. I know. I know <laughs> you didn't mean to do it on purpose, but man, that that actually brought a smile to my face. That's great. <laughs> Deep Valley Dub Divers. divers. <laughs> that was that. <laughs> I swear to God. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Mark. That man, that brought a smile to my face. You know what? I actually have tears right now. I'm laughing. I'm All right. laughing so hard. But uh, so, anyways, so I did you, want to point out too is that Elijah Wilkinson. So on the Broncos website, all I did was just pull their 90 man roster, just sorted up by positions and everything like that. And Elijah Wilkinson happened to be with their offensive guards or offense, interior offensive line or whatever it was. Yeah, but guard slash tackle. He's the guy that I'm going to sit there. I'm going to move him over to tackle because he's competing for that left. Ta- he's competing for the left tackle spot. He's probably going to be a depth piece at left tackle, probably play and be, provide some versatility to be able to play inside as well. But I definitely think that he's that guy right now for that number, that number three tackle spot. Yeah, he's he's most certainly your swing tackle, uh, especially after watching Juwan James. Not he played what sixty six snaps, I believe it was last year. Uh, Elijah Wilkinson started the majority, like the vast majority, aside of sixty six snapple uh, snaps exactly. Uh, Elijah Wilkinson was your starting right tackle last year, so he at least has the ability to do so. Now, if he's good, that's a conversation for another time. But at least he can at least he can line up as that that third offensive tackle, play the left or the right side. I prefer him at the as a swing guard than a, as more so than a, a swing tackle. Now he's going to make the roster. There's no question about that. He was actually my third lock at the offensive tackle position, based on what we saw. Not only the comments from John Elway saying that Elijah Wilkinson was going to compete for the left tackle position, but just what we saw last year, and also looking at the depth. Jake Rogers was horrendous last year and his limited time, especially in the preseason. He he played fairly decent towards the end of the season, but in the, last two, in the last two games, Jake Rogers actually played really well. Ah, and not just because of luck. Like, he played really well on by himself. So, it's definitely interesting, but the thing is, is he can't play left tackle. No, he's better suited to play the right is. tackle. <laughs> yeah. So, that, so th- to me, that might be the fourth guy that you're talking about, but this is where the conversation goes, and this is where Zach Kelberman and I agree on. The Broncos need to go out and sign a, a, a left tackle or a, a just a tackle depth piece in like a Kelvin Beecham or a Cordy Glenn or whoever might be available. Like You're trusting Elijah Wilkinson, who gave up 10 sacks last season, gave up some of the most pressures in the entire NFL. Jake Rogers, who struggled, played decently on the right side, can't play the left side. And that's your backup tackle class? Like, that's who you have? You have to upgrade the backup tackle position, period. Yeah, I definitely definitely agree a little bit there. Um, I mean, I touted before that Denver should be looking at an offensive tackle. I've made a few articles or videos that I've mentioned it. I definitely agree because, quite frankly, I mean, Jake Rogers, he's lo- he looks good as a right tackle, but that's all he can do. And you already have somebody like that as Elijah Wilkinson, and you don't want somebody – who lacks the versatility of Jake Rogers, who you, he can't play left tackle. He can't play inside. So he's a right tackle only. You can't have that. So for the sake of this, because I'm not going to sit here and go say, oh, yeah, we're going to leave this spot open for somebody for, for to go sign. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Is We are going to make a 53-man roster from the 90 men that the Broncos have. So my fourth tackle is going to be Quinn Bailey because at least he can play inside. He played inside a little bit during the preseason last year. He played both sides and played decently there. So I'm going Quinn Bailey over this, over Jake Rogers here for this fourth tackle spot. Calvin Anderson, to me, he doesn't have the size. He's more of a guy on the inside. Hunter Watts, he's just so unknown at this point, played at a small school, and I haven't even been able to find any kind of tape to watch him on and study his 
his play in college. So I have no idea what his traits are, what he looks like or anything. So, yeah, I'm going with the guy that I somewhat know in Quinn Bailey, who has the versatility. You know, I actually had Quinn Bailey making the practice squad, but it was going to be a very easy persuasion for me to go with Quinn Bailey making the active roster. And you pretty much made it, just the versatility that he does have to be able to play the inside as well. Elijah Wilkinson has that versatility to play the inside. That's a big thing with me. How many positions can you play? Can you play multiple positions, right or left tackle? But also not only that, can you play on the inside as well? Jake Rogers doesn't have that kind of versatility. I had Rogers making the original roster for me just because he made the roster last year and Quinn Bailey did not. Yeah. Now, well, that, mean, was, that, was, was that was the one, huh? Quinn Bailey was a rookie. And that's very true. And he did make the practice squad last year. So now you've got the opportunity to see him grow and learn a little bit. Quinn Bailey is probably the guy. And like I said, I had Quinn Bailey on the practice squad just because Jake Rogers made the roster last year to just kind of keep with the continuity, to keep with the veteran, the guy you know. But Quinn Bailey, they already know him. They had him all year last year. Why not put him in, in into the active roster? Yeah, I agree. So moving on to offensive guard, I think it's safe to say. I mean, Dalton Reisner, Graham Glasgow, like like that's safe. Yeah. Like, obviously, no duh. And then we come to an interesting conversation because we have Austin Schlotman and Nathaniel Moody. And I think that, honestly, I think both those guys, they make it. Nathaniel Moody, he's healthy. He's good to go. I don't think we're going to see him a lot this year unless injury happens. They're just going to want him to get coached up a little bit. I think that he is, for a six-round pick, I think he's pretty safe because of the fact that he, without the injury concerns, he is a second-round pick. And I think that teams, with all the issues they have on their offensive line, at this point, I think they'd be willing to risk that. So I do think that the last two is Austin Schlotman and Nathaniel Moody with Nico Falla and Tyler Jones potentially competing for a practice squad spot. That was something that I actually wanted to ask you. What is the state of Natani Moody right now, and what is his health looking like? Now, you've got, you've got the, the Achilles injury, I believe. You've got a, a, multiple, a multitude of knee injuries going with Natani Moody, going back to Fresno State. The last time we saw him play a full season was, what, 2017, I believe? So yeah, I there's, injury, there's, there's injury concerns to have there. Nico Falla didn't look great last year, but at least he played. You know, no, he, he, got there. he didn't play last year. He was hurt. Talking about oh, injuries, Nico Fall has barely seen time for the Broncos because he's always been hurt. Oh, well, that did, excuse me on that one. Uh, Austin Slotman was one, though, that did yeah. play towards the end of last season. He's going to be a lock to make this roster. He was actually the third offensive guard that I had to make the roster. So the conversation comes down to, is it Natani Moody or is it Nico Fallow? What is the, the health of the two? And per what you just told me, Natani Moody being healthy? And yes, Nathaniel he, Moody. Nathaniel Moody? Nathaniel Moody. Uh, well, excuse me on that one. Uh, but uh, regardless, Moody being a six-round pick could have potentially been a second-round pick. Is he the guy that you're going to put in as your fourth offensive guard? Yes. Or are you going to look as a, look to maybe go in? Uh, well, again, we're not signing anybody off, so th- th- I, apparently that's our offensive guard class. Yeah. I mean, it all it comes down to without looking at anybody who's a free agent is I'm going. I want to keep ten. So we yeah. have eight, and I think that our centers, obviously there's no debate here. There's two true centers on here with Lloyd Kutchenberry, Patrick Morris. Those are your two centers, right? Yeah, yeah, no, no so, question. But yeah, so you basically want to keep 10 about it. And when you're looking at your offensive guards, Tyler Jones and Nico Falla, maybe Calvin Anderson can come in and compete there. As I said, I do think he's more of an interior offensive line. But I'm taking Nathaniel Moody over them. And the reason is, even though he was a six-round pick, even though he has his injury concerns, is I think picking him up off of waivers, put him on the teams on your active roster, I think teams will have no issue with that. And so I think that Denver, if they want to keep him, if they want to continue to develop with him and work with him, they have to keep him on the roster. Yeah. James Campbell coming in and says, if Nathani Muti is healthy, he has to make the roster. He reminds me a lot of Will Hernandez out of UTEP from 2018. I really wanted uh, Will Hernandez as well. Eric, can you speak to a comparison on that? They're actually very similar. That's one comparison when I talk to scouts and everything that was often thrown around was Will Hernandez, Nathaniel Moody, they're the same kind of thing. They're the same type of player. They have that same temperament. They have those same strengths. They have very similar weaknesses. Only thing that the biggest difference was that everyone said that Nathaniel Moody is a little bit more mobile as a blocker than Will Hernandez was. He had a little bit quicker feet. 
which is fine. I mean, th- that's obviously, I mean, and then the counter thing is that he wasn't quite as strong as Will Hernandez. Still plenty strong, just not quite as strong as they saw with being able to just basically work his blocks to a stale, stalemate. So very similar, a lot of similarities there. Denver really liked Will Hernandez. Granted, their coach at the time had a big role with that. I'm sure Mike Munchak has a, has a big fan of Nathaniel Moody, so... That's that, and I believe that this looks as this wraps up our offensive line and our offensive side of the ball with having ten offensive linemen. Which keeping eight guys active on this is it's not hard to do because Denver has no. so many so much versatility here. Jawan James, Garrett Bowles, Elijah Wilkinson. You have three tackles there, and then you're keeping Dalton Reisner, Graham Glasgow, Austin Schlotman as your active guards. Maybe Nathaniel Moody if he's able to beat out Austin Schlotman for that number three spot. And then like Cushenberry and Patrick Morris. There you go. There's your eight guys active. You have plenty of versatility because Austin Schlotman can also move inside to center. Graham Glasgow can also move into center. Patrick Morris can play guard. And Elijah Wilkinson can play guard or tackle. We have options. Yeah, there, there's a lot of versatility there. Can Lloyd Cushenberry play the guard position if there was, say, Graham Glasgow and Austin Schlotman go down? Could you bring in a Patrick Morris to play the center position and then slide Lloyd Cushenberry to the right guard? You could, but I think that at that point you'd just rather if, – if Lloyd Cushenberry ends up the starter and, say, you lose your – your right guard, Graham Glasgow, and your backup guard, main guard, and Austin Schlotman, I think well, you're either going to want to insert Nathaniel Moody or Patrick Morris into that spot. Instead of moving center, having Lloyd Cushenberry picking up the stuff at guard and then picking having Patrick Morris pick up the stuff at center. Yeah, that's fair. What about Elijah Wilkinson at right guard? I mean, that's off, That's also a possibility as well. I was just yeah. looking at the guys on the interior for the most part for that. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Now, uh, let's see if we can't pick up a Get couple back to the comments chat for a little bit. Yeah, Mark Langley coming in with a with a two dollars super dude. You just love bulls. Admit it. Hashtag state of stench. It's not that I love bulls. I just am tired of this narrative of people driving him down into the dirt and over and over and over again, calling him the worst left tackle in football. He showed statistically last year he was not the worst left tackle in football. He's actually a very competent left tackle especially if you give him a quarterback that knows how to manipulate some pressure, step up in the pocket, and get away from the edge. Drew Locke can actually do so. Garrett Bowles is going to be a, at least a, a high-quality player, and he's a, he's a dark horse guy to make the Pro Bowl at left tackle this year. That's my chest thump. I said that. Garrett Bowles, dark horse for the Pro Bowl this year. All right. With, All right. with that comment, guys, I'm going to go. That's a little bit rich for me, even. Um, but no, I think that I mean, obviously, I've said it before. Garrett Bowles gets a lot more hate than what he than what he deserves. I mean, he really did step up his play last year, and I know that there's some people who are like, "Well, his play that shouldn't that shouldn't erase all the bad he's done," and it doesn't. But the thing is, too, is that his rookie year and his second year, they they haven't been as terrible as fans make it out to be. Like, he has gotten a little bit better each year. The holds are annoying. Don't get me wrong. Those are super annoying. Got to coach those out. Got to get those fixed. That's a constant issue that you're going to have. Like, if you don't, like, you you can't deal with that. You got to get that fixed. But he's still a good tackle. Like, yeah. you, you can't have a star tackle every single year. It just doesn't no. work. He is better than a lot of starting tackles out there. He's not better than a lot of starting tackles out there. He's not top 10, but he's probably in that next group after that top 10 of that next of that top 11 to top 20 guys. That's where Garrett Bowles falls in. Like, let's face it. He's a solid guy. who's going to sit there and a lot of his holds are doing. He's holding to protect his quarterback, which is what a lot of offensive linemen are taught. Like, if you're going to lose lose because by you holding then potentially getting your quarterback hurt. So that's how it, that's what it is with Bulls. I mean, I get a lot of people want to hate on him and everything and just laugh at us for sitting here defending him. I mean, we're not going to just sit here and crap on him because of because of some holding calls or anything like that or sit here and lie and say that he's been um super terrible every single year of his career. Like that's not us. Like I've done a lot of pieces out there that have ripped Bulls to a part Heck, during last season, last October, I had I did an article about it about how Denver needs to figure out a way to bench him. And, and he yeah, he has that. had more hold, call, holding calls on running plays. I didn't say that he didn't. I said that a lot of times when he's holding on, what I meant, well, meant to say was when he's holding on in pass protection, it's because he's trying to protect his quarterback, keep his quarterback from getting hit. Yeah, and no, some no. of those calls on holding is on the run plays. 
Some of them have been questionable going back to last year. Yep. And Cole Mooch, if you don't want to listen to this, you can come back here in a few minutes when we're done talking about bowls. <laughs> like, it's not that hard, man. You, you can sit here and do your eye roll emojis, but, and your sleeping emojis, but we're going to talk about it because it's part of the conversation that's going on. We had to talk about them for the thing. It's just how it is. I know you don't agree with us. A lot of people don't agree with us, but it's how it's just the fact is that. Bulls gets a lot more hate than he deserves. Absolutely. We see it on the we see it on the show a lot. That's why for so long is we didn't talk about Bulls. We didn't address his name. It is what yeah. it is, man. You can't have a star at every single position, and there's so many Bronco fans out there that think you have to. And it's gone to the point where it's just annoying at this point. Yes, it absolutely has. And in fact, that's why we gave him the he who shall not be named moniker on this podcast, because we broke him down not only once earlier in the season after his massive holding game that he had, I believe it was against the Chicago Bears, where he had like five holding penalties or something like that, and we're like broke down what he was doing wrong. We've talked about him again after the, the fifth year option was declined. It's just tiring talking about the same guy over and over. And it, I'm tired of, yeah. pardon my French here, I'm going to use some colorful language. I'm tired of everybody shitting on Garrett Bowles. Literally. I'm tired of it. And that's there's no room for it anymore. Like you look at it as an objective analyst and look at the play that he has. He's actually a quality left tackle. Now, to move the conversation for uh uh to, excuse me, to to move the conversation forward. Terry Randall coming in from Canada again. Uh, hit that like button. Uh, absolutely, guys. Do do the, the greatest things that you guys can do to show support for the podcast. Like, subscribe, share wherever you're at. Like this video. Share it out to everybody. Now, let's get on to the defensive line conversation here just a little bit there, Eric. Yeah, because and guys, just so you know that we knew that this was going to be a little bit longer. We're not getting out of here just yet. We're going to try and get this done. We knew that we'd probably push probably closer to to – two hours instead of one. Um, we're trying to go about this as fast as we can, but also keep you guys as part of the chat as well and or conversation as well. So. Yeah. yeah. All right. So going, going to the interior of the defensive line, I have, I have four guys that are locks to make the roster. This is oh, actually I'm... a true statement is it just takes one hit. Holding is about living another day. That is super true. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, James Campbell coming in. Uh, with that comment there. Yep. Now, Thanks, go, go, go into the interior of the defensive line here. Let's round this back up to the 53-man roster, guys. Uh, go into the interior of the defensive line. I have four guys that are locks to make the roster, and Jarrell Casey, obviously one of the best interior defensive linemen the, the NFL has seen over the last five seasons. I mean, perennial Pro Bowl player, five times in a row to be exact. Uh, a guy that can disrupt not only in the in the passing game, pushing the pocket up to the interior, but also is a very quality run defender as well. Uh, I have Shelby Harris, a guy the Broncos went out. They didn't give him the money that he was actually looking for, but he did get get a contract extension from the Broncos, a one year deal. Draymond Jones. Former third round pick from the Broncos last year, 2019. Uh, I actually got to meet him in Nashville uh, briefly, just a little bit, or well, talk about him in Nashville, excuse me. Uh, but uh, Draymond Jones, a guy that uh, is on the up and up and up in the Broncos in the Broncos roster, quality pass rusher, very quality run defender as well. And then McTelvin Ajim, third round pick this year uh, from uh, in 2020 from what is it? Where is he from, Eric? I Arkansas. am having Arkansas. That's right. I always had. I always want to say Mississippi State. Uh, quality interior pass rusher uh, needs to develop in the running game. But those are your four guys that I have as locks to make the roster. I would put Mark Mike Purcell as a lock too. I mean, he's the only guy on there that can really be a nose tackle. That's a. You know, that's an interesting conversation just because it's such a limited niche role in this Vic Fangio defense. You, have Especially, you do have to have it. But if you're going to run that 3 3 5 and pull, that's the first player you're pulling off of the defensive line is, is Mike Purcell. We talked about that last week. Yeah, it is. But you still have to have that nose tackle about it. And there is literally no one else on this roster who can do that job. Do, do you not think that McTelvin Ajim can actually do that? No. He's, he doesn't have the size for it. So in your standard nose tackle, your whole job is you're going to sit there and you're going to two gap. You got to have the strength to sit there and hold your blocker in front of you while watching the a gap on both of your sides. McTelvin Ajim, he's a little bit longer. He's got a little bit more of an athlete. He's not quite as strong. And if you're, you're playing him as a nose tackle, you want him shooting one of the gaps, either right. shooting the right a gap on the left guard or the a gap between the right guard. 
you either you want one of that. He's not going to be the guy that's going to sit there and hold that. There isn't anybody else on this roster going to sit there and hold this center. They're watching both a gaps and keeping the run shut down. Basically, Mike Purcell is it. Fifty percent snaps perhaps a season, maybe even a little bit less. But he's going to fit. He fills that niche role that no one else does. So yeah, he is a lock to me. I mean, I guess that's fair, especially if you're looking at him as like a, a specific rundown kind of a, a defender. Yeah. So let's see here. Going back to my, uh, yeah, I did have actually a, on my original 53 my roster, Mike Purcell, just because you're absolutely right there. Now, what about Joel Heath? There's a there's another true nose tackle right there. No, he's not. Joel Heath's not mean? a nose tackle. What do you mean? He's barely played there, first of all. I don't know where this okay. whole thing that he can play nose tackle is. He's His role in that nose tackle position has been similar to the Draymond Jones and McTelvin Ajim role in the nose tackle position. There's, you're shooting a gap. That's what he's doing. Right. He's not going to hold it. He's not going to shut it down. He is a three-tech guy is what Joel okay. Heath is. So he's a guy who he's going to be competing with um, Draymond Jones, McTelvin Ajim, Shelby Harris, Drill Casey. Um, Christian Covington, Walker, Harris, he's going to be competing with all these other guys for okay. that 3-5 tech who can also go in and move in a little bit. But, yeah, he's not He's not a nose tackle. He's not. No. Okay, that's fair. Now, is this potentially the end of Demarcus Walker yes. on the Broncos roster? Yes. And uh, are you going to keep a sixth defensive lineman? And if so, who is that? So I've gone back and forth on this about who this 60th defensive lineman is. And part of me is, I don't know what our number is, by the way. So at one of these points, I have to go count count it up and see what we're at. But um, I don't know how many, because uh, this is going to make a big factor in this, is this is one of those spots where I really don't want to keep a third quarterback because I would like to keep seven defensive linemen. With those last two defensive linemen being either being a combination of Christian Covington and Jonathan Harris. If we're, I'm only going to keep six right now, and we can come back and add another one later if we have space for it. Is as much as I want Christian Covington, Vic Fangio sees something in Jonathan Harris. They worked with him a little bit last year. I think that Jonathan Harris has that spot. That's fair. I actually have Jonathan Harris making the the practice squad. Give him another year to kind of ripen just a little bit underneath Vic Fangio. And I had Christian Covington making the the original 53-man roster here. So that might be the battle to watch at the defensive line role there. James coming in. I think they roll with six interior defensive line, maybe seven, uh, maybe seven, excuse me. I really like Covington. I like Covington last year in Dallas as well. Yeah, I, I mean, he was all right last year, and he can definitely have an impact. That's why that last spot, it comes down to Christian Covington and, and Jonathan Harris for me. But it just comes down to the fact that Vic Fangio, there's something in there with Jonathan Harris that they're working on building up. Jonathan Harris is the way I'm going. It's just a, it's just a, such an interesting conversation there because the Broncos brought in C- Christian Covington on a free agent tender there, and Jonathan Harris still has practice squad availability. That is a point, too, but so does Christian Covington. Yeah, that's very fair. So I'll let you think about that. I want to grab this from Mark Langley real quick with the $4.99 donation. Sorry, the metal makeup. I'm assuming you have to say mental makeup. Has to be there. Four years. Come on, dude, for real. Learning disability. LOL. Ask Zach. He'll tell you. Truth hurts. Um, We're not going to get into this about Zach or anything like that. Um, Zach has his opinions. We know his opinions. We don't agree with him. That's fine. But, man, don't come in here and say learning disability, LOL. That's something that really does not sit well with me. Um, There's people who I really care about. My daughter has learning disabilities. So don't come in here saying learning disability, LOL, like it's a joke. Garrett Bowles has a learning disability that has had gave him issues for his whole life. Going back to high school where he had a very rough upbringing and everything, got into a lot of trouble there. Like, don't. If you're going to do that, man, just, just don't come. Like, I hate telling people not to show up and everything like that. I really do. But man, don't come in here like learning disabilities are a joke. It's not okay. Yeah, that's a that's a hot button issue with both of us. Actually, we'd appreciate it if you would leave that out of our show, anyways. Uh, 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 well, not only the learning disabilities part, but the the continually crapping on somebody over and over and over again. That's not what we do here. We bring you the best analysis that we can bring. And the the constant downing on somebody and the constantly bringing somebody down and everything like that, it's it's not what we like to do here on Dub Valley Deep Divers. I'm sorry. So getting back to this, getting off of that subject and everything before temperaments start to really flare and everything, <laughs> um, seeing somebody in here talk about Walker and how he found a decent role last year. 
the thing is, is Walker is that he lost his role. Even after he was back and healthy, he was still a healthy scratch for a game, which was the first game back that after he was healthy, he was a healthy scratch. Um, and then he lost his role. Draymond Jones took it over and he barely played again after that. Um, one second, I can actually pull it up too. But yeah, he just lost his role about it. And that was, that to me is the biggest sign that Demarcus Walker is done with the Broncos is he was a healthy scratch. He lost his role with his, within this defense. Let's see here. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't, only, he wasn't only a healthy scratch towards the end of the season. He was a healthy scratch towards the beginning of the season. Like, no, he it, wasn't. He it, started out, he played the first eight games, then he got hurt. Then he missed, um, I think it was like the first week after the bye week. Um, God, I got to go back and think here. He, he, he was, like, that was considered healthy because what the bye oh, week was week ten, right? But, no, he got hurt week. He got hurt week eight. Um, came was a healthy scratch for weeks twelve and thirteen when he was cleared to go. Played a few snaps in week fourteen, few snaps in week seventeen, while being a scratch in week fifteen and sixteen. So yeah, he lost his role. He played a total of two hundred twenty snaps, most of that coming in the first eight weeks. God, it's just so hard to think about Demarcus Walker and actually playing in a football game. Honestly, like that's how little of an impact he actually had. I yeah. didn't even realize he was actually an act uh, on the active roster. But it does make sure. sense, though. Derek Wolf had an, an active game there out of Gossis. The whole conversation that you and I had there. Uh, why is Demarcus Walker playing? That's right. I do remember that. And then um, James, are you sure it's four? What I read is that with the new roles going up to two, is that you can only have two players with any number of crude seasons. And then there's another thing of three where you can have two, um, no more than two, but no less than two or something like that. Hold on. I can actually pull it up real quick. I just had it on my phone. Um, so yeah, so it's players with less than one accrued season. Um, players who haven't been on the active roster for fewer than nine regular season games during their only accrued seasons. Players who have earned no more than two seasons with any number of games and players with any number of seasons. And then the limitations of this is any team, uh, a team may have only four practice squad players whose eligibility is based on group three, which is with no more than two seasons with any number of games, and only two based on group four, which is the any number of seasons. So that's okay. that. And <laughs> yes, Kenneth Booker, Adam Gotts is still unsigned. So right. James, where if wherever you have that, I'd like to see that because I mean, what I'm reading may be wrong too, but uh, maybe wrong. So I don't know, but that's just what I was reading. So that's what I was kind of going off with this. But yeah, so who who are you going with this to get on this defensive line and move on a little bit? Uh, to me, I don't know. Just just the pet project with Jonathan Harris there, Christian Covington coming in with the free agent signing there. Uh, honestly, it, it's one or the other. One of the two is going to make this roster. Uh, my original guy was Covington, just because you could put uh, Jonathan Harris on the on the on the practice squad, not realizing that Christian Covington still had the uh, the the practice squad eligibility. But Christian Covington did play for the Dallas Cowboys last year in actual games. Go with what you know. So I was actually going to say that is there's two ways I can go with this. Christian Covington, he's played in games, he's seen action. Jonathan Harris has seen a little bit of action, not nearly as much. But Christian Covington, his action hasn't been, was with the Texans and the Cowboys. Jonathan Harris, he spent time with the Broncos last year. He knows this defense. Yeah. Christian Covington was signed in May. That's fair. That's a very fair point. The Broncos did. Uh, when did they pick him up? It wasn't he. It was he just was after a, it, draft. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So you know what? Put Jonathan Harris on that. All right. And Christian Covington is actually a prime candidate to make the practice squad in this. Now, moving towards the ed- edge position, obviously the top two guys, Von Miller, Bradley Chubb, those are the two. I mean, th- those are your premier pass rushers in this Broncos defense. Now, the third guy I have here is a guy that really came on strong towards the latter the latter half of last season, and this was after Bradley Chubb got hurt, and they, the Broncos made a priority uh, free agent signing on Jeremiah Tauchu. And they, they let Malik Reed kind of play, especially in that, that Chargers game where Malik Reed actually had a really good game, but Malik Reed fell off and Jeremiah Tauchu took that spot, took the starting spot on that Broncos defense and played very well, very, very well, especially in the running game. Man, he was so impressive. Jeremiah Tauchu is my third edge defender on this defense. And this is where it comes into the, the, the conversation of the true death guy. Is it Derek Tuska? Is it Malik Reed or what are they going to do with Justin Holland? Uh, 
Eric, you're muted. Sorry, I muted because I was dropping stuff as I was grabbing my notebook. Um, for me, Jeremiah Tauchu, he's the number three edge. With what he did last year, he showed up better than Malik Reed. I mean, Malik Carney, he was on the practice squad last year. Derek Tuska is a rookie. Justin Hollins, I, as I was saying, well, muted, to me is more of an off-ball linebacker. I believe that the Broncos still want to look at him doing moving to that off-ball position, kind of being that edge cover guy kind of role that Leonard Floyd kind of played with the Bears for a little bit. Okay, So for me, Jeremiah Tauchu, he's the number three. My number four guy, for me, I think I would be going with Malik Reed at this point, simply because he has the experience. Um, Malik Carney, Derek Tuska, they don't have the experience out in the, uh, not even just playing, but in the uh, defense, really. I mean, Carney was with the practice squad last year, but yeah. um, that's more so for Tuska. So for me, the number four guy here is Malik Reed. I actually kind of agree with you on that. I really want to see him be able to stand up better in the running game. And just the the, the simple flashes that he had as a pass rusher, uh, especially in that Chargers game, he had a sack and a half, I do believe. Uh, week five, that was that was the game that Alexander Johnson actually broke out, had that interception, a huge game, the, his first game in action. Malik Reed really played well, but he just doesn't have the ability to stand up against the run. Now, speaking to Derek Tuska, I'm not sure about him. I know he's a lot twitchier than Malik Reed is, but standing up against the run, I'm not sure where he stands there. And that might be the conversation to have as your depth edge defender. Is Malik Reed good enough against the run to hold off Derek Tuska? Yeah, I definitely agree. And uh, let's go to the chat for a little bit so I can do, get our account and see where we're all at and everything. And because that's okay. going to be like, play an impact for the next few positions for sure. Okay, so I've got a super chat coming in here, a very generous super chat from uh, from DW. It takes a lot of discipline, devotion, and love of the game to pour over stats and tape. I want to say I appreciate you, Eric and Lance, because this devotion brings a savor to the discussion that makes it so much richer, richer, excuse me, and leaves us so much more edified. Hey, man. The fact that you guys come in here and listen to us dole over these stats and watch the tape and and everything like that to to come and listen to us, it it, it drives me to be better. I need to be a little bit better tonight. I do do understand that. But for you guys to come out here and show your appreciation, your love, and to your generosity, especially you, DW, that that really makes us want to work harder to be able to come out and give you we're at an hour and 25 minutes on this podcast to give you a deep dive on every single player on the Broncos roster right now to build this roster the way it's that it should be built you guys are what actually drives us to be able to do this yes definitely um Again, DW, thank you so much we really appreciate that uh you got your kind words really mean a lot and everything and- yeah just, I mean, I'm, try, I'm trying to find the right words. Uh, Lance took a lot of the words right out of my mouth for this. Um, it's always nice to know that our, the work that we put in and not trying to beat our chest on this or anything like that. We, we try to stay as humble as we can about this because you guys, I mean, obviously we wouldn't be able to do what we do without you guys. Yeah. Like your guys' support is what's kept Molly Huddle going on for so long while we're able to do these live shows and everything like that. And so it's all it's it's nice to feel rewarded, I guess, would be the way to say it. And again, I'm not trying to say that, like beating my own chest or sound arrogant or anything like that. But it's nice to know that you that there are people out there who appreciate it because um, it makes for those long nights of staying up watching films. It stay it makes those times of um, not uh, of the, the time that we have away from our families doing this, trying to put in all the work that we need to. Like It just, it just means a lot. We really appreciate that. Yeah, it is. It is really hard, especially, you know, I I know the work that Eric puts in. I've been a part of this for a long time now, and I know Eric's been a part of this for a lot longer than I have. And I I know what he does uh, to be able to put out, I mean, what, 400 players? that you that you scout every single year um for me i I get like 150 um to be able to do that to not only have a family life to be able to to have a a work life outside of this um it's 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 very hard and it just means a lot that every single night we come here on friday night and be able to talk to you guys and to to see you guys come here and support us regardless of what we're doing is absolutely amazing so all right eric what's our count to get away from that, to get away from that poignant, but also very heartfelt thank you to everybody in Broncos country. Eric, what's our count here? What are we at with our so, uh, 53-man roster? Provided I'm not wrong with my math, which 
getting a little bit of arrogance here. I'm not normally wrong with my math. Um, is we are at counting the three special teams players because obviously you're going to have three special team players. You're going to have your kicker, your punter, the long snapper. Even though we got to have that lovely debate about the long snapper. Owen Moyer. We, we got to have that conversation. We're going to get to that conversation. We're at 38 counting those. So we have 15 spots open for these last three positions, which okay. means, I mean, obviously you can go however name, way you want as long as we get to get to 15 people. Um, then we have the, the practice squad. So we got to get this go through this a little bit faster because we still have quite a bit to do, and then we again got to want to have a little bit of a conversation with you guys about the, how this looks overall. So getting back, oh, guess I should probably pull this back up too, and get back down to where we were. So All right, I think it's a safe lot. to say Todd Davis and Alexander Johnson; those are your top three linebackers, right? Yeah, there's no question about that. Alexander Johnson is a – he should have – if he would have played the first four games last year, Alexander Johnson would have made the Pro Bowl. 93 tackles in, in 12 games. It, it, all the tackles for loss. I think he had a couple forced fumbles in there as well. Just that guy the, – the one thing, and I think that there is something to work with here, is I want to see Alexander Johnson be able to move backwards. I want to see him be able to move side to side in the passing game and to be able to develop a, a coverage linebacker, which this defense is so drastically missing and the guy that I want to bring in for my third linebacker he was what the Broncos I think fifth round pick this year Justin Sternod out of Wake Forest that's the third linebacker you're going to see on this roster just because he does offer that coverage ability that neither Alexander Johnson has shown to this date or Todd Davis who has at least serviceable in coverage, but he's not the greatest kind of a guy. You've got two downhill linebackers in Alexander Johnson and, and Todd Davis. Justin Cernod can step back, be that coverage kind of linebacker, a little bit small, a little bit more agile side to side, not quite the deep, like long speed. What do you run like a four or seven, six or something like, like a lot of, not a, not an athletic tester like that, but at the same time, very, very comfortable moving side to side, very comfortable moving backwards. Um, as far as the other linebackers, this is an interesting conversation. Josie Jewell being the, the the incumbent here on the roster for a couple of years now, a guy that I really like coming out of Nick's school in Iowa, uh, a very uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? Um, cohesive kind of a guy, cognizant kind of a guy, understands what he sees in front of him. He's just not athletic enough to be able to be that true coverage linebacker that I thought he really could be. Uh, Joe Jones may be a possibility here, but for the fourth linebacker position, obviously Justin Hollins is the guy that the Broncos are going to bring on here. But I don't know, man. Between those three, is there a guy that's really too like true clear cut to be the fourth linebacker? So for me, I want to go go and do cornerback and safety, and then come back to linebacker. Okay. And there's a there's a few reasons for that. And just because part of the reason is that safety and cornerback are a little bit easier. So we're going to go scoot over and we're going to go straight to safety here because obviously you have Justin Simmons and Kareem Jackson as your for sure guys. Yeah. And then for me, I think, I think that you also have Duke Dawson to make it as well. I mean, he played that nickel nickel safety role when Will Parks was out with an injury he played. He showed his potential there. I think that it's safe to put him on, put him on there, as well, and let him see what he can do and try and take fully take over that Will Parks role this year. No, I don't disagree with that. It's just very. It's a going back to the cornerback position, and I know that the Broncos have Isaac Yadam listed as a cornerback right now, but I really want to see what Isaac Yadam can do as a safety, and especially playing in the box. I want to see what he can do coming forward as a tackler, similar to that Kareem Jackson role, similar to that Will Parks role. I want to see what Isaac Yadam can do there. Duke Dawson actually had the opportunity to do so, but Isaac Yadam never really did. He was stuck on the outside battling with uh, Devontae Harris, I believe it was, especially towards the latter half of the season, uh, the Minnesota game specifically, where I believe Yadam got benched, then Harris got benched right after that. So, it's, it's hard for me to go there because I really want to put Isaac Adam instead of at the cornerback position. I want to put him at that third safety spot and see what he can do there. I agree, but I think that, again, going back to this with everything going on in the world, we know what Duke Dawson can do there. We don't know right. with Isaac Adam. I think that part of that is going to be that they're going to sit there and kind of work with Isaac Adam during the season and try and get him to develop as a safety a little bit and kind of be that hybrid type player while they roll with Duke Dawson. 
And that's a fair thing. Now, the other side of that coin is Isaac Yadam has played on the outside. Has Duke Dawson actually played on the outside as a boundary quarterback? Not really, no. So why would you not want to have Duke Dawson play that that third safety role, whereas you can keep Isaac Adam? Yep. It's just a it's a very interesting question to to the versatility between the two guys. Duke Dawson's gonna make the cut here. Now, this is one that kind of really is a quality conversation to have. Trey Marshall versus Douglas Coleman. And I don't know exactly which way I want to go here. Douglas Coleman is such a ball hawk. He gets his hands on a lot of footballs. Trey Marshall definitely suited as a guy that is better off the ball. I think there's some versatility that you can have with Douglas Coleman. And honestly, between the two of them, they both have practice squad eligibility. But just a guy that you can have as another versatile kind of a player, Douglas Coleman to me is the guy that makes this 53-man roster over Trey Marshall. Oh. I want to agree so bad. I want to so, so bad. I have, I mean, multiple times I've sit there and told, said that I'm not comfortable with Trey Marshall. Uh, I have so many concerns about him and his play multiple times. I want to go Douglas Coleman, but he's a rookie. In a year with no offseason programs, with two preseason games, Trey Marshall, he played last year, and the team thinks that thought that he played decently well. I wasn't – I and, wasn't necessarily unimpressed with this play i just wasn't like that's the guy yeah and my thing is is if i'm going to push for anybody over trey marshall i'm pushing elijah holder why is that he was on the he was on the practice squad last year they're working on converting him from cornerback so he knows the defense he has the advantage well not really an advantage over trey marshall but an advantage over douglas coleman with knowing the defense and being able right. to step in no, with that fact and try and perform better but again, it just comes down to Trey Marshall saw the field. The team likes liked his play last year. I think that he would be basically in terms of true safety. I think that he is the number three safety with Duke Dawson playing that hybrid or type role. I man, I don't know Douglas Coleman though, very flashy, very rangy, and Trey Marshall very rangy as well. With I'll two games to show it, say with, what? Two game, with two games, Douglas Coleman has two games. Maybe even no games because they, they're talking about that, that the NFLPA, they don't want no games. So we know he only has at least two, at most two games right. to show that he can go out there and beat out Trey Marshall. Is that uh, enough? The, the thing is, is this is the, the biggest thing that I disagree with you is Elijah Holder in this aspect. Elijah Holder is slow, man. He's not very rangy, and they're going to tr- try to move him mm-hmm. to the backside. I don't like that. They did last I don't year. Like- I, I still didn't like well Elijah Holder. I, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I, I would have rather watched well, I don't Marvel. like you. I don't like you either, <laughs> so stop talking trash, dang it. <laughs> no, it's just uh, Douglas Coleman's so rangy, man, and Trey Marshall's more rangy than Elijah Holder. I, I understand where you're coming from with the, the whole knowing what you have. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And but still, there's so many, there's so much more ball skills with Douglas Coleman the third coming out of Texas Tech than there is with Trey Marshall. Yeah, but and I games. firmly believe that. I, yeah, <laughs> man, it's a, uh. any and any other year if there was still four preseason games and everything like that, I would agree with you. I'd go Douglas Coleman in a heartbeat. But it's the same thing with Brett Rippin. It's the same thing with Royce Freeman. It's the same thing with Deontay Spencer. It's the same thing with um, Jonathan Harris. Trey Marshall, he knows the defense. He knows what he's doing out there. Plus, out of everybody out there, he's probably one of the best deep, true deep safety that they have. That's very true. That is very true. And uh, going back to my original 53-man roster that I had for our first four in, first four out, Trey Marshall did make my roster. I'll go with you on that Boom. one. Douglas Coleman, Douglas Coleman, though, is a very interesting conversation. We'll see how would, that actually plays out. Said, normal year, I would be right there with you with Douglas Coleman. Yeah. All yeah, right. Now, yeah. guys, Bawana coming in here and showing a very poignant message as well. First things you can do to make sure you help the show grow. Subscribe wherever you're watching. Like every video you see and share it out to your comrades in Broncos country. All right. Let's go to the chat stream just a little bit here. Uh, let's see if I can't find something good. <laughs> Kenneth Booker, I should be the backup punter, LOL. I'm trying to get paid. I, I, can't, I can't actually punt. Have you ever tried to punt a football? It's not necessarily as easy as you think it is. Oh, it's easy for me. Like I, I can't, am so I can't, skilled at it. No, I, so, I can put it any direction you want me to, but I can't kick it more than about 25 yards. So my idiot self a few weeks ago, I, th- I think I kind of told you about this story and privately, 
but um, I felt like I was going to drown because we went out to a lake a couple weeks ago, well, yep. probably a little over a month ago. And the reason why I was swimming out there, and I haven't swam in quite a while, and um, I was, <laughs> I punted a football about three quarters across this little lake. And I had to go swim and get it. And I hadn't swam in a while. It's been like 10, 15 years since I swam. And uh, I got water in my mouth. I started coughing. And yeah, just not fun. So <laughs> because of my ability to do punt a football pretty dang well, I about killed myself. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't go punting a football middle <laughs> three quarters of the way down a lake. <laughs> All right, Stephen Baumgartner coming in and say, hey, guys, hey, Steve, I, I sent you a message earlier, but I wanted to just uh, reaffirm that uh, your hat is on the way. Dove Valley Deep Divers hat is on your way. Uh, the uh, For Jacob Doan, if you're listening to this after the fact, I have not actually gotten a confirmation email for your giveaway merchandise, the hat and the T-shirt that we gave you, away to you for the, uh, the 50th episode. It has not actually cleared my email, so I will let you know as soon as possible. All right, Eric. Let's get back to this. I'm going to add your. What's again? What's again? What's again? What's again? Oh, I'm still. I'm still trying to fin- fix stuff up and make it a little bit neater here. Hold on. Bear with me, you guys. Sorry, I'm <laughs> slow with this. Eric, figure it out, man. Come on. I love Jewel Stud. Not sure he makes this roster though. I'm actually in 100 percent agreement with you. Uh, the outlaw Josie Jewel. Uh, I. That was actually one of the first pieces I wrote for Mile High Huddle was a film review on Josie Jewell, and it, it was very fun to be able to sit back and dive into him. And you could see the athleticism wasn't necessarily there with him, but at the same time, the ability to diagnose what goes on in front of him. I really like in uh, Logan Wilson from Wyoming as a Josie Jewell that's more athletic. Uh the, the ability to see what happens in front of you, react, put yourself in the right position. Josie Jewell was able to do that at Iowa, but at the same time, Logan Wilson was more athletic and it was more able to do so at Wyoming. And that's why Josie, or, well, Logan Wilson was the, the, the number one overall, the, the number one pick in the third round this last year. So I, I'm really looking forward to see what he can do in Cincinnati. Uh, James Campbell coming in from across the pond. Uh, Feel so much for those on the roster bubble, not just for the Broncos, but all around the NFL. Some of these players might not get a chance again. So many battles all over the roster that deserve yeah. to be settled on the field. And I totally agree with that. Just it's, there are guys that you, I mean, if, if you've ever watched the NFL network show undrafted, there are a lot of guys that put their heart and soul into this and they go to these regional combines and they work their butts off and they, they finally might get an opportunity to step on the field and to be able to, uh, you know, make their, make their mark in the NFL to never actually get to do so this year, specifically with what, with what's going on in the world, it makes it so much more difficult for guys like that to be able to do so. And, there's another guy that we're going to get to here sp- speaking to the cornerback depth that might not actually get an opportunity to do so in former uh, Wake Forest cornerback Essang Bassi, undrafted free agent out of Wake Forest. Yeah, sorry. I was kind of reading something else here. Um, but uh, so let's get to let's get to this cornerback. Sorry, I just completely zoned out on what you were saying. Lance. Sorry about that. Um, I was reading Charlie's comments about Alaska. Alaska lakes and how cold they are and no punting on the tourniquet arm. Um, but anyway, so for this, I think with cornerbacks, obviously AJ Boye, I mean, I mean, Bryce Callahan, let's move him over. Let's move Michael Ochimudi over. Now what? The, and this is, this is where I was at. I messaged you before we got onto this live show and was asking, well, I said, I have my locks to make the roster. And those were my three guys. I had AJ Bouye, Michael Ojemudia as a third round pick. And then I had in parentheses, Bryce Callahan. I don't know. Like we don't know with Bryce Callahan. He's still a, a hypothetical player in this Broncos defense. Is he a lock to make the roster? Like, is his foot actually ready to go? Is he is like, from all accounts, he's ready to play like right now, but is he going to be the same guy that we saw in 2018 under Vic Fangio? Like we don't yeah. know with Bryce Callahan. Now we're going to the depth of this. Shaquille Taylor, who is that? Isaac Adam, we've already seen the the struggles that he has had. They're they're 
possibly talking about switching him positions. Devontae Harris got his spot taken by Isaac Adam, lost it to Isaac Adam, uh, took it over from Isaac Adam. You've got Devontae Bosby with a scary neck injury that he had in, in 2018 after he played at least fairly decently. I thought he had amazing moments, especially in the Raiders game. Even early in the Chargers game before he got hurt, he had a couple of really good click and close plays coming up to make some tackles in the open field. But then going back again, right before you ignored me, uh, Asang Bassi, what is his role in this defense? Is he actually even going to make the roster? Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think that for that reason is you got to look at the nickel. And I mean, I know we have Duke Dawson, Dawson there for the nickel. We have Bryce Callahan there for the nickel. But I'm going to put Devontae Bosby on here. I think he not necessarily showed it enough last year, but I think there is enough hope around him with potential that he showed when he was with the AAF to sit there and continue to work with him and to work on developing with him now that he's healthy. Um and it's kind of it's one of those things where I mean, yeah, he was around and everything, but he was hurt. But I think that there's still enough that if Denver cuts him, somebody else will bring him up. And I think they want to continue working with him. So I'm going to move him over. And now the last two, because I think that Denver is going to keep six um, with this. And I really want to keep a song Bassey because outside of Bryce Callahan, there's no other real nickel corner on the Broncos. I mean, Duke Dawson, he can drop down and play the nickel. Cream Jackson can drop down and play the nickel. So you have that versatility there that you, I don't have to do that. And then it goes to the fact that he's a rookie. Isaac Adam and Devonta Harris, at least they played last year. At least they know this defense. Yes, Isaac Adam was benched and for Devonta Harris, and Devonta Harris was benched for Isaac Adam. Well, Isaac Adam was benched for Devonta Bosby, then came back, then was benched for Devonta Harris, then was benched. Devonta Harris was benched for Isaac Adam, blah, 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 blah. So it's really gets just to me, interesting to me. For me, with how I'm going to do it, just because the situation is, I'm going Yadam and Harris for the final two cornerback spots and putting Asang Bossy on the practice squad. You know, I don't disagree with that, honestly, because you got, you have the opportunity to call Asang Bassi back up off the practice squad, put him on the roster, and have an extra special teams player there. I don't know, though. I like Asang Bassi as that nickel defensive back that could play yeah. in the slot, could play on the outside as well. Uh Devontae Harris is specifically an outside cornerback. Isaac Yadam, we'll see what that actually looks like. Getting him on the inside and, and working forward more than laterally, I think that that's probably a better better look for him playing at that safety position. Devontae Bosby is a guy that I really like there. Uh, Harris being able to play on the outside specifically, the, the outside depth really scares me. I don't know, man. I like Asong Bassi, though, because he has the versatility to play inside and outside. So whereas whereas uh, Yadam and Harris don't uh, Yadam I'm, if he's going to play on the inside you're going to have him off the ball driving vertically more or less. Or, so Yadam's what? not going to play on the inside. He's going to be a boundary guy. Devonta Harris is more likely to play inside than Yadam would be. Yeah, man. So what I'm gonna what I'm gonna suggest just for the sake of time because we have 15 minutes left before we hit two hours and um, is Isaac Yadam. And Devonta Harris with the song Bassey as on the practice squad as a for sure guy in the practice squad. Don't even know yep. you need to go and do that conversation. Yep. Because of the potential to call him up if need be, if Bryce Callahan gets hurt. I think that a song Bassey does have something with this team going forward. But with the situation is I think that he's gonna be um uh be kind of pushed down a little bit for those who know it. So I'm confident confident doing that. Yeah, well, so yeah, Adam and Harris, that, that actually works for me, too. So let's go ahead, and I'm going to move it up. What if my thing will let me go over to the practice squad 12. There's a song, Bossy. No even conversation about it. Practice squad, that's him. All right. All right, so where are we at here? We've got our safety. We have two We've spots got... left. We have two well, not spots count, left. Not counting the special teams because the th- special team is three. So you technically have five spots left, but we have two spots left for off-ball linebacker. Which is this worth it? This is where things get interesting for me. You have two versatile guys with Josh Watson and Justin Hollins. Josh Watson played a lot of edge last year in the preseason as well as off ball, kind of trying to be that edge off ball hybrid type thing as Justin Hollins is. And then you have two special teamers, Josie Jewell and Joe Jones. So I think that that's what we're looking at one of Josie jo- Jewell and Joe Jones, and one of Josh Watson and Justin Hollins. For me, With the first group of that, Josie Jewell and Joe uh, Joe Jones, going Josie Jewell. I think he offers up a little bit more on defense if he has to play on defense. And he actually actually showed last year that he's a darn good special teams player. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right on that. Just the the 
again, you know, he's not the, the greatest athlete, but just because he's so smart and he can diagnose what's in front of him, he actually brings a lot of versatility. He may not be the best at straight like a man to man coverage scheme, but he can, he knows how to drop into zones. He can move laterally enough to, to be able to cover, especially if you get him into the deep zones, like what, uh, like what Vic Fangio likes to do with his linebackers. Those deep zones get him back and moving backwards just a little bit. Josie Jewell can be able to do that. Now, to me, Justin Hollins, as far as the athleticism side on this, going back, uh, th- there's also some versatility with him as well. He can play and come off the edge as well. Joe Jones, I'm not sure if he can do that. I'm not sure if Josh Watson can do that. And honestly, I want to put Josh Watson back on the practice squad again. I actually agree. Is I think that Justin Holland showed he actually saw time on the field last year. He showed that he can play the edge as well. And we only kept four edges. So I think keeping the guy who's the most versatile of the bunch who can play the edge and thing, because as I said, Josh Watson, he did play it. He looked a little bit better on, on the edge than off ball, but he still got a lot of developing to do. Is I'm going with the guy who showed at least pretty well uh, as an edge guy. But also, I mean, his time as off ball wasn't that great, but you're still working on developing him. So for that final spot is I'm going Justin Hollins. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that one. All right, and let's go to the chat for just a few moments here while I go and clean this up. Nick would say Jewel for sure. Yeah, he would. Yeah, actually, I don't know. Nick and I actually had a conversation about that. And if I remember right, he wasn't – I mean, I don't want to say he was bad-mouthing Jewel, but he wasn't talking – Super highly of him, so to speak. James actually coming in here. Uh, do you cut Trey Marshall and move Yadam to safety full time and keep Bassey for the nickel? In a normal year, yes. I am not I sure I agree out, with that. Is I, I'm not sure that I agree with that. Honestly, I think that Trey Marshall offers a little bit more deep safety versatility than Yadam does, and Bassey, Bassey and Yadam are a lot of the same player. I think that you can get a lot of the same out of Bassey that you can Yadam. And honestly, I would cut Yadam over the fact of cutting Trey Marshall just because Yadam's not going to be able to play that deep ranging safety. Trey Marshall can at least come down inside if he has to. Did you say Yadam and Bassey are the same player? Not really. I mean, there, you can get the same kind of a role out of them. No. I mean, you I have a boundary corner and you have a nickel corner. Well, Bassey can play on the outside, though. Not really. I, I think he can. Not I think he has, no. I think Dude's he has barely 5'9". Well, he may not be able to be. A, you can have a 5'9 <laughs> cornerback playing on the outside. We watched Chris Harris Jr. Not, maybe not necessarily very effectively, but you can have exactly. a guy that can play. A, you, you can have a guy that's 5'9 playing on the boundary. It's happened all over the course of the NFL, man. Come on. Like, it, they, can have, just, they can have, but, they can have, they can gonna have somebody 7-foot playing quarterback, but just doesn't mean it's going to be effective. Can you have a 6-foot, <laughs> one, 205-pound guy that has zero hips and absolutely horrible flexibility play on the inside and actually be effective? Can you add him do that? At least that's Bassey can play on the outside. And, Isaac and Adam is, a, is a, just a boundary corner, and a song bossy is just a nickel quarter. That's the whole point. So a song bossy is very smooth in the hips. He can sit there and he can yeah. hang with the receivers in man coverage, and he's not that good in press. Isaac Adams in press. Okay, I see where you're coming from. On that one. <laughs> I I see where you're coming from. Now I'm talking about position versatility. Like at least Bassey can play multiple positions. Yadam is outside. He's I would see, like I to see him coming down vertically. See, I don't, th- I don't, I don't think that he can. I think that Isaac Yadam would be a little bit more versatile because what he can do as a safety as well. As long Bassey, he can't really do that stuff as a safety. I mean, That's Isaac fair. Adam, he doesn't have great range. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he can be a rangy guy, but he's he's a guy who can go play kind of like in that box safety kind of role. And play kind of those that cover two kind of safety role as well, and drop down and play a off off ball nickel a little bit, depending on the type of receiver. Like if it's a, if it's a tight end in the slot, then yeah, I would trust Isaac Adam to do that a little bit if he's able right. to develop. But all right, we got to get this going. I got to get going. I have family in town and and everything yeah. like that, so we got to get this moving. Um, Let me go where do we go down. from here? Special team. That's the last thing before practice squad. So obviously we have. Brandon McManus, and Sam Martin, your kicker and your punter. All right. Bob and Moyer, Farnsworth. Which one can break a dinner plate over my head at 25 yards? Tell me. I don't care. <laughs> What's Farnsworth? That's the guy that I'd be going with. That's the guy that I've gone with for it. And the simple reason is that he, he's got he's a little bit more experienced and just that. He's just a little bit more experienced. Eric, I'm going to bounce out for just a second. I'll be right back. Okay. 
So for me is yeah, as I'm going to be doing this, I'm going to have to go go on. I'm going to add this with um, Lance real quick. Sorry about that, guys. That he had to bounce out. But yeah, I'm going to go ahead and go with West Farns with Lance. Kind of push that off onto me. And before even going to this, I'm just going to delete Jake and Bob and Meyer, Bob and Moyer, because I don't think that you're going to keep a long snapper on the, pr- the practice squad. So boom, there goes Jacob, Bob and Moyer. Now, before we get into the um, practice squad, I hope Lance is able to come back for this because I do kind of want to go through this with Lance and get his takes on it and everything. Obviously we put a song bossy on there already. I'm going to go ahead and move. Yeah, these over. Turn them that. So we'll come back to this and finish this up when Lance gets back. I'll just take a few questions here and everything like that. Um, thank you for a great show. Hey, thank you for joining us. Um, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Miller Seven Hundred Seven Champ who said that we were his favorite show. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um. Even though we we really shouldn't, we kind of do have this uh, internal composition. At least I do. I'm a very competitive person uh, with uh, the other shows about being better. And I always rub it in Nick's face privately and everything like, oh, so-and-so said that we're the better show. Uh, But yeah, um, before Lance gets back in here, I will say this too. It's just kind of a reminder. Tomorrow, Luke Peterson. Patterson? Patterson. Patterson. Sorry about that, Luke, if you're watching. Um, just had a complete brain fart. At least I didn't say Luke Polglaze like Nick did. <laughs> All right. Um, but uh, he's got Luke's got something to do with his family. Um, he's got some some plans for the Fourth of July. And since it's not not something that my family's really big on, we obviously do our do just a little thing every year. Um, Nick asked me to jump in. We're going to be doing that. Um, I'm not going to spoil the the topic for you guys, but it's going to be an interesting one. So make sure you guys come join us for that. Um, definitely a very interesting conversation, especially and one that you guys can really get into and be a huge part of. Yeah, it's I, I actually know the topic for tomorrow, and I can tell you, you guys are going to want to tune in on this one. Sorry for having to take a break really fast. I had a phone call, and uh, Lance might be in a little bit of trouble. Got to be moving this forward just a little bit. So, all right, so we're on the practice squad. I just uh, went and put Wes Farnsworth as a long snapper. Yeah, you know, kind of. You kind of pushed that off onto me, so I made the I made the executive decision, <laughs> and that's fine. All right, so going to the practice squad, I had one guy already taken off of the practice squad for me because we put Brett Rippon onto the uh, the original fifty three man roster, and this is where it's going to come down to: Do you guys want an, uh, another quarterback? Is Riley Neal going to yes. be the other quarterback on the practice squad? And that's probably a good uh, good way to go, Eric. I agree with you. You got to have I don't that. Think, I don't. In the end, I don't think it'll be Riley Neal per se. But I do think that they will have a fourth quarterback on the practice squad. And so I, I want to put Riley Neal there just kind of as a placeholder. Because I do think that they will have a, as I said, a fourth quarterback on that. So I'm going to go ahead and throw Riley Neal over there. And I also want to really throw Levante Bellamy over there. Because, again, I think that with what um, with what he show or what he the potential he has, I want to put him over there. Because he can do so much for this Broncos offense. But they've seen stuff out of Kalfani Muhammad. So I also kind of want to put Kalfani Muhammad over there over Bellamy. So this is actually a, a conversation that I had, not necessarily with you, but with myself, because I have Levante Bellamy making this, uh, the original 53 man roster. And we'll have to go back over through the roster math and figure out who we're going to cut or whatever. But I have Levante Bellamy making the roster just because he's got the, the special teams versatility can b- bring in. It. This is where I have Levante Bellamy specifically over Devonte Spencer, because you can have Levante Bellamy be that kind of a return kind of a guy. Um, so I had Bellamy there, but I did have, because Bellamy made the 53-man roster for me, I had Kalfani Muhammad actually make the, the practice squad as well. So and we don't have Bellamy here on the on the roster, so let, let's put Bellamy on the practice squad because I think that there's a place on this Denver Broncos team for him. All right, I definitely agree. And I do still want to keep kind of Kalfani Muhammad on there. So I'm not going to delete his name just yet. We'll go and come back, see if we are able, are able to have a spot on him. Sorry, I put Bellamy in the wrong spot. See if we are able to have um... – hold on. Uh, I mean, have, an extra, have an extra spot for him. But I am going to delete Jeremy Cox because I just don't think that there is a spot, an argument for him really. Um, he doesn't have the, the versatility that Levante Bellamy does. He doesn't have the experience within the Broncos organization as Kalfani Muhammad does. No, I, I agree with you on that. Um, 
Now, going going forward just a little bit, the, the first guy that I have on the practice squad is actually Andrew Beck. That's the first guy I have on the practice squad. It's the first guy that I have yep. coming off of the practice squad to, to be on the active game day roster when the Broncos do actually expand to 55 to go on game day. Andrew Beck's that guy. He's a, a depth tight end, a quality special teams player, but he also brings that fullback versatility if, if uh, Pat Shermer does want to go into a into a – a 21 personnel or 22 personnel goal line situation, something like that. Andrew Beck's going to be the guy that they're going to bring on there. Um, outside so, of that, it, it, it would either be Andrew Beck if he doesn't make the roster. If Andrew Beck doesn't make the roster, he's there. Austin Fort's my guy, though. If Austin Fort is not on the, the opening day roster, I would want Austin Fort on the practice squad. I think there's something to work with there. He's a sneaky athletic kind of guy. I think you can work with him on some special teams kind of stuff like that. I don't know how he works out of the backfield, but I do know that when he was at Wyoming, he was a fullback type, uh, a fullback tight end hybrid in uh, Craig, Bull, uh, Craig Bull's offense. So he does know how to work out of the backfield. I'd be very interested to see how he works out of the backfield as a receiver there. So before we continue on putting people on the practice squad, let's see something real quick to help kind of make the decisions a little bit easier. Let's go through these position by position and take off the guys who we don't think that will make it. Starting with tight end, since that's what we're talking about, I want to leave Jake Butt and Austin Fort, depending on if we have a spot for them, maybe we can have the debate about which one of them to have on there. But I think Jeff Hireman, I mean, if he doesn't beat out Nick Vanette, I think he's done. I mean, Denver, they were trying to move him prior, during the draft. Nobody was willing to take him. They couldn't get a right trade going. And I also think Troy from Magali. I think that he's basically done at this point. If he doesn't make the make the roster, I don't think he's going to make the practice squad, and Denver's just done with him. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that, actually, 100%. It, Jeff Hireman's pretty much seen his last days in in a Denver Broncos uniform. He's probably going to be a cap casualty. Um, right. Now, receivers here, this is one that's going to be interesting because there's a lot of similarities with receivers. And the first one I'm going to say here, and I'm going to suggest we just completely take off, is Jawan Winfrey. Yeah, I've, I've heard I've, some stuff there about his attitude. I've heard some stuff about his work ethic and his desire and everything that just makes me concerned. And I think that he's just limited compared to uh, some of these other receivers that we potentially can be talking about to make this. And another one is Zamari Manning. And it just comes down to the fact that he's from a small school. He's a guy that nobody really knows about. So I think that the lack of preseason, the two games, that I mean, at most the two games, just basically continues writes him off. Now, I'm going to fight back on you on Zamari Manning just because Tarleton State, yes, it's a D3 school. Yes, he's not probably going to see the field very much. But you know what? The guy scored 22 touchdowns in 2019. He had another 12 in 2018. The guy knows how to get the ball into the end zone. He absolutely dominated the competition. And there was a comment earlier. He plays a lot like Demarius Thomas, bigger kind of a body. It's not going to be that way in the NFL. And it's very – like. To me, the, the explosive playmaking dy- dynamic that he brings at the wide receiver position and the, the ability to put the football into the end zone makes him a very intriguing kind of a prospect. And if you could put him on the practice squad, I would be all right with it. However, I agree with you. There's just no room right now. There's, there's. I mean, you've got Fred Brown, who who saw time on the roster last year. You got Tyree Cleveland, who's a seventh round pick. You got Trinity Benson, who made the practice squad last year. Kendall Hinton also saw some time in the preseason as well. Zamari no, Kendall Hinton's a rookie too. Oh, excuse me. Uh, there was another one. Uh, Kelvin McKnight was Kelvin the other. McKnight, yeah. uh, Kelvin McKnight saw some time last year on the roster, but not on the roster, but in preseason. Like Zamari Manning has a very uphill battle. Tarleton State is a school that I don't even know if like ninety nine percent of the NF, uh, like the nation, has heard of Tarleton State. Yeah, it's and, it's just so hard to see him making this roster. And one thing too is why I suggested him. I'm going to suggest Kendall Hinton too, even though I really like Hinton. Is when looking at these other receivers, you have. You have Trinity Benson and Kelvin McKnight. Both have been with the Broncos last year on the practice squad. Um, You have Tyree Cleveland, who they just drafted. And you have Fred Brown, who made the roster. You have four guys there who you can easily make the case for before Hinton and Manning. So I'm going to go ahead and take out Hinton and Manning both just for that reason, which sucks because I actually really like Hinton and his potential. And if they do expand it beyond 12, then I think that Hinton has a good chance for it. And even Manning, too. But just right now with the 12 people that they have on it, I think they're going to want to be going with guys that know the playbooks have some, or they have some idea of what they can do already. Yeah. And then going on to offensive tackle, Jake Rogers, he's practice squad eligible. I think that I'm going to leave him on here. Calvin Anderson, I'm going to leave him on here. Hunter Watts and Nico Fala are the two guys here on the offensive line. I'm going to go ahead and take off. I mean, 
same reasons as we did with uh was the Mario Manning and Kendall Hinton. When it comes to tackles, he's just a low guy there. And Nico Falla, he's been hurt so often that you already have that have somebody who's dealt with a lot of injuries in Nathaniel Moody. You don't want another guy for to be that on the practice squad. You really might as well take Tyler Jones off of there as well. I don't really agree with that because I think that on the interior, he has a shot because he can also play tackle a little bit. He can play all five positions. So I think his versatility will help will continue to give him a chance. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll I'll take your I'll take your opinion on that one. I don't know a whole lot. I'm not about saying he's going to make it, but I mean he's worth keeping on there for now for a discussion later. Well, uh, Calvin Anderson was just the guy that I was going to put on there just because he had the he he's already seen the practice squad for the Broncos, so yeah. why not give the give the continuity to the guy Tyler Jones. I don't know a whole lot about the guy, anyways. So if he can play all five positions, and sure, uh, a position versatility kind of a guy, a guy that you can groom, especially with Mike Munchak, why not? But Calvin Anderson, he's already seen the Broncos, the Broncos room. Well, the Broncos facilities, excuse me. Just like, why not just roll with the guy you already know? And uh, real quick, big body boy. I know this is long. We knew it was going to be long when we did this. Trust me, we're feeling it too. My office is roasting. I'm sweating so bad. You guys can see the shimmer on my face from my sweat. <laughs> Although it's good because I need to lose weight. And then James, I'm sad too, man. It's not fun deleting these guys, man. It's not. Like, yeah, not. It's never fun. Anyways, right, so go to Trey go Crawford to- and Sh- I think when uh, Trey Crawford and Shaquille Taylor. Um, I think that with a song bossy Shaquille Taylor, he's kind of off. Especially if you have um, as many outside guys as we do on the fifty-three man roster, I think he's safe to come off. And with Trey Crawford, is I mean with Josh Watson and Joe Jones, if we're keeping a linebacker, I'm keeping one of those two over Trey Crawford. Yeah, I, uh, Josh Watson's the guy that I'm looking at. If you're gonna if you're gonna keep a, a linebacker, Josh yeah. Watson's the guy. All right, now getting to the safeties, um, Douglas Coleman, Elijah Holder, PJ Locke. Those are the three that, for me, it comes down to for a safety practice squad spot. With Coleman having the edge over everybody else, because yep. as you highlighted with the argument for the 53 man roster, he just has such good ball skills. Yeah, no, I'm in total agreement with that. I could see Holder being there, and and in fact, I actually have him on my practice squad, the one that I wrote down before this, only because I had it broken down to, is it Douglas Coleman or is it Trey Marshall that makes the 53-man roster? In fact, I have the the loser of that battle, Douglas Coleman and Trey Marshall and Elijah Holder on the, on the practice squad. I'm keeping two safeties there. All right, and then last but not least, let's clear up this defensive line a little bit. All right. This is this is where it gets interesting. Demarcus Walker should be cut. I think that Demarcus Walker has a chance for it for the practice squad, so I want to leave him here. But I also want to leave Joel Heath and Christian Covington. I don't know, man. It's just so hard to see Demarcus Walker coming off that second yeah. round pick and not actually showing anything. I'm, yeah, I'm fine to lead in his name, man. I've hated, I've hated the selection of Demarcus Walker ever since it happened. Um, I think that the second round pick status might be the is really the only reason that I'm actually kind of even think considering leaving him on here. But as when we're talking about the defensive the defensive line for the 53 men roster, one of the things I said was that he was replaced. Yeah, yes, but he was. He has so much experience that if somebody gets sick and everything, then he can come in. But then you have Christian Covington, who has that experience too, or Joel Heath, who has a little bit of experience too. Well, the and they is, both fit the defense a little bit better than Demarcus Walker. That, so I am perfectly fine removing Demarcus Walker if that's the way we go. That is exactly what I was getting ready to say. Was Christian Covington can at least slide inside and play the one tech? Joel Heath can at least slide, slide inside and play the one tech. Demarcus Walker probably not sliding inside. He doesn't have the body stature to be able to do so. He's he's less than three hundred pounds. He's not going to be able to stand up in the one in the one technique. He can play the five. He can play the seven if you want him to. But he's not going to be able to slide inside and offer some versatility to the interior of the defensive line. And he's definitely going to get blown away and run and run defense, which is what we've seen him do for the last four years. Well, yeah. three. Years, excuse me. Like it, <laughs> Demarcus Walker has no room on this roster anymore. He's he's weighed out his his warrant. Like there, there's nothing for him. So I got to point this out. This comment really made me laugh. So Buana beast to James. Happy day you lost, James. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, that's a good one, man. Um, all right. Rude. So because it's we're coming up on two hours and ten minutes here. Ooh. Yeah, we need to. We, need to um, we gotta get this down. So we have four spots taken. We have eight spots left. All right. Um, we'll come back to Kalfani Muhammad. We'll come back to the running back or the, the tight ends. 
let's talk about the receivers here. I think that two receivers out of this four are going to end up making the practice squad. I have Tyree Cleveland and Fred Brown. I do too. <laughs> Fred okay. Brown showed a little bit towards the end of last season playing on the special teams. He showed a lot in the preseason, uh, being able to, to stretch the field a little bit vertically. Uh, I like him just because of the, the special teams prowess that he does have, the versatility there. Um, he's also – Am I mistaken in saying that he's a little bit Deshaun Hamilton as well? Like, is is that a he's, wrong? Take? He's, like, he's kind of he's wrong. kind of that, yeah. Like they're they're a lot that like very similar. Now go to, go to the tight end position here, Jake Butt versus Austin Fort. And well, we already have Andrew Beck, so let's come back to that because I think that Andrew Beck's versatility there. I don't see the reason to have another one if there's other spots um, open at the end of this after we get to the rest of the positions then we can come back and add one. And I know exactly who I would advocate for, but let's go up and let's see what space we have left afterwards. Cause I think with Andrew Beck, that's enough for that right now. Yeah. Uh, so Calvin Anderson versus Jake Rogers, the offensive lineman. And this to me comes down to the position versatility. Jake Rogers is specifically a right tackle. At least Calvin Anderson can slide inside. Um, I think both make it really. Okay. I think Jake Rogers for the tackle ability, and I think Calvin Anderson for his ability to play inside to help add that versatility to that. Versatility to that. Yeah, I think that he makes it. Um, I really want to put Tyler Jones here too, um, just because, again, with the versatility that he has, uh, that I think that Calvin Anderson, Jake Rogers, they both make it, and Tyler Jones is another name that we would come back for, that I would make the case for. If we have one extra spot left at the end of this, I will pound the table for Tyler Jones because I've heard a lot of positive stuff from this um, from people within the organization about him. Well, as of right now, if we had to pick one of these three guys, I'm taking Calvin Anderson. That's that's where yeah, I'm. I'm picking. At. I'm putting two on there because typically the Broncos have two or three offensive linemen on their practice squad every year. Typically, one tackle and one guy who can play inside. So just because I really hated what I saw out of Jake Rogers last year, even even the last part of the the season. What I saw from Jake Rogers in the preseason, give me Calvin Anderson and Tyler Jones, please. But the thing is, is that while they can play tackle, Jake Rogers is the best tackle out of that group. I, I, I still, I'm, I still, I'm not going to relent on this, man. It's, it's Jake Rogers is making, for me, is making this practice squad. <sighs> man, it's so hard for me. It, it really, it, well, I, I did have Quinn Bailey or Jake Rogers. So, you know what? Give me Jake Rogers. Uh, and uh, uh, you know what? Give me Calvin Anderson too. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, so going back to where are we at here, we got the practice squad ninety: uh, uh, Douglas Coleman, Elijah Holder, PJ Locke, uh, James Campbell. Uh, James Campbell actually asked about PJ Locke. What do you got about PJ Locke there, Eric? Um, I don't know much about him. I've heard a little bit of good things, but nothing to really sit there and push for him to make it. Um, I think that Douglas Coleman and Elijah Holder and Christian Covington, those are the three names that I'm looking at for this right now out of this, this group right here. So let's, let's just put Douglas Coleman on it because you and I are in agreement on that one. Yeah. Um, you could probably give me Christian Covington as well. And if I'm going to go anybody else on this one, so what are we at? Nine? Or is that eleven or twelve? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, That's eight, ten. Nine, ten. Okay, so I want Derek Tuska as well. I like the. I agree. I, I like the uh, the edge presence there. I like the the twitchiness. I like the ability against the run. And if we're gonna keep another linebacker here, give me Josh Watson. He's got the versatility. He's got the health too. Joe Jones was hurt last year. Um, Malik Carney, I'm not necessarily sure he can play the off ball. Josh Watson can at least drop back into some coverage. He's not the best in coverage, better as a, as a two down thumper kind of moving forward, but at least he has the, the, the the versatility to do so. Jones might be a better coverage linebacker, but at least Watson has the health. Give me, give me Josh Watson. I actually agree on that. And that wraps up our 12 man practice squad. Um, it's definitely a bummer. I would keep, um, I mean, obviously, with a few of these guys, you'd be keeping them in contact with them just in case something happens. Like Califani Muhammad, if yep. the running back gets hurt, yeah, I'm calling him up to join the practice squad with Colin Bellamy up to the roster. Tight ends, Austin Fort, Tyler Jones would be right there, Elijah Holder, Joel Heath, Joe Jones. Like, I would definitely be keeping an eye on those, but 
just because the roster math doesn't shake out. It, I, I mean, it is what it is. Like, not everybody can make a roster. That's that's how the NFL works. Like, there's there's only a certain amount of jobs. There's only a certain amount of practice practice squad spots. Like, there there are going to be a lot of quality players cut off of a lot of different quality teams that have the ability to play in the NFL, but you can't have them all. You can't have the top left tackle in the NFL every single year. You can't have the the best cornerback depth in the NFL every single year. You can't have the best interior offensive line. Denver, I think, has a, a very high-quality offensive line, but the depth outside of the, the top three, the starters, probably not the best. I mean, Schlotman's okay, but yeah. Patrick Morris, we don't know about him. Natani Moody, is he actually going to be healthy enough to play? The, the 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 offensive tackle depth for the Denver Broncos. You have uh, what Jake Rogers, who we just put on the practice squad. We have, uh, I mean, Quinn Bailey. Who, I mean, is it Quinn Bailey or is it Jake Rogers that makes the the the, the fifty three man roster? Who is actually going to be the backup right tackle? Is it Elijah Wilkinson? Is it going to be Kelvin Beecham? Like we don't know. It's yeah. so hard to be able to do an exercise like this, and we appreciate all of you guys for joining us on this. Every single. Yeah. One- we really got to get out of here, though. It's been two hours, 15 minutes. Um, I did kind of want to go over it a little bit. Maybe next week we can sit there and kind of go over it and kind of continue this um, yeah. a little bit. But, yeah, we got to get out of here. I mean, two hours. We really push it enough as it is. Um, typically, we try to get out of here right about an hour. Uh, yeah. We but, want uh, we wanted to do this entire exercise in less than two hours. And to do the practice squad after the two-hour bell – that's where people get tired and that's where we yeah. get tired. And that's, I mean, it's, it's hard to do a, a big two hour show, even the, the draft show. Oh my goodness. That was so exhausting. But anyways, guys, thank you all for joining the Dub Valley deep divers podcast. You can find the show on Twitter at DVDD underscore pod. You can find me at Sanderson MHH and for Eric at Eric trickle notice the CK and Eric and the EL and trickle. Also, Guys, if you're in a financial position able to do so, head on over to huddleuppod.com. That's the merch store. Get your swag on. Get yourself a hat. Get yourself a T-shirt. Get a, a coffee cup, a face mask, a hoodie. There's something for guys. There's something for girls. Pretty much anything on any of the other the podcasts as well. Also, follow at Mile High Huddle on Twitter. It's the mother account. That's where you get updates on not only milehighhuddle.com, but the Huddle Up podcast, Dove Valley Deep Divers, Building the Broncos, Mile High Insiders. That's where you get updates on everything. Keep your fingers on the pulse of what's going on in the Mile High Huddle community. Now, Eric, before we get out of here on this very long episode of the Dove Valley Deep Divers, do you have any last words? I do. Um, Nothing Broncos related. I just want to say, guys, Enjoy your 4th of July tomorrow. Those of you who are in the United States, stay safe out there. Don't drink and drive. Stay safe, but enjoy your day. Yeah, absolutely. Eric, happy 4th of July to you and yours. I hope you guys have an amazing weekend. Guys, always stay safe and take care. And you guys have a great 4th of July weekend. We will see you guys next week, 6 p.m. I will see you tomorrow. Uh, Eric, we'll see you guys tomorrow on the the Mile High Insiders. But anyways, Dove Valley Deep Divers, we'll see you guys next week, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We'll see you guys later. Goodbye.